donated to us today to have it. So please, please, please go and, and have a look. It's incredible. Um, change to the program. Uh, Alexander Stickings will unfortunately not be able to come today. She just messaged mo this morning that she's really not feeling well. On the STEAM panel, um, Alexandra will also, also won't be able to make it. Xavier will be replacing her today. Xavier, who was on the talk yesterday. If you have any questions, don't forget to go to uksays.org slash nsse slash question, or put your hand up. Um, also, a massive, massive thank you to UK Quantum Technology Hub for sponsoring the captioning. The captioning link will also be up later, so you can see it one more time again. Just, everything's being streamed again today, as, of yes, as was yesterday, if you want to watch everything again. I believe that is it. With that in mind, I would love to introduce you to Matt Davies, who is an incredible guy. Um, Matt? Are you ready to cheer everyone up for the day? Absolutely. So, are we good for you guys here, I think that's all. Are we all right, yeah? Perfect. Right. Yeah, there's a button that says mic or mute, and it was on mute, and that's why you couldn't hear me. How was yesterday? Good? Fun? I've got the graveyard shift. You guys went out last night, did an all nighter, and then, like, oh, great news, Matt. You can fly down from Edinburgh and speak to them in the morning when they're either hungover or at the very least exhausted. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. That's great. It's lovely to be here. So, First question is, who is Matt Davies and why is he here? I'm not here to talk about space. Unlike everybody else that's on the program yesterday and today, all people who are specialists, experts in various aspects of space, I'm not here to talk about that. So I'm breaking things up a little bit, giving you something to change up. I'm here to talk about leadership. I'm here to talk about things you might need to think about as you move into leadership. And leadership doesn't mean being the CEO of a company. It means how you lead yourself how you move into business, how you contribute to organizations, how you contribute to society. So hopefully in the next half an hour, we'll have an opportunity to think about how you uh, be, become the type of leader that you're capable and destined to become. Sound all right? Beautiful, beautiful. I'm getting blind about that. I get tan of ginger as well, so like if I go over here, get a suntan off that thing, you know, I have to just watch myself. I need to be careful. Okay, this is what we're talking about today. We're going to do a bit of a self-audit to start things off, talking about how you kind of start to, to assess where you are. Then we're going to talk about your vision and purpose and the value of that. A little bit about motivation, how to motivate other people to help you achieve the things that you're destined to achieve. A little bit about networking, and this weekend is a perfect example of that, why that's so important, some things you can do to get better at it. Something about balcony and dance, which is about delegation and how to delegate more effectively. And then finally, some ideas. Again, this is you guys' time. If you're there thinking, this guy's shy and I have no interest in what he has to say, there's a great exhibit across that's very interactive with the ball thing. We don't know who provided it or what it is. You can go and have a look at that. Or you can sit quietly, make no notes, wait till the half hour's passed, and listen to the rest of the presenters. It's yours entirely. If it's useful to you, take something away, do something with it, and hopefully it'll have been a worthwhile use of half an hour. So, here we go. Sell for it. First thing you want to do is think about what are you great at? What are the gifts that you have that you bring to the world? Now think not just about the hard technical skills that you've got, but think about those softer skills, sometimes called interpersonal skills, sometimes called um, enterprise skills. Your ability to communicate, your ability to network, your ability to influence other people. What are the skills that you have that could make you effective as part of an organization, okay? You want to think about what evidence do you have to support the fact you're good at it? I know loads of people that think they're good at certain things. They're not good at those things. I have no idea where they've got that idea from, right? And I've probably got a few of those things too, right, if I'm really honest with myself. So it's about taking the time to look at your skills, your capabilities. What evidence do you have that shows you're good at these things? What are the gifts that you bring to the world? As well as being a leadership coach and an, exe an executive coach and um, a consultant and a speaker, which is what I do for my day job, I also coach American football. So I'm the assistant head coach of the Great Britain national team. I'm the head coach of the Scotland under-19 team. And I also coach kids football as well. And in American football coaching, we use the phrase, put your players in a position to be successful. Don't take a tiny guy and make him block a massive guy. It's never going to be successful unless the guy's got immaculate technique. Okay, so find ways to avoid blocking that guy or to double team that guy or to put your players in a position to be successful in some other way. And what you want to do with your career, with your life, is put yourself in a position to be successful. Find the things you're good at and play to those strengths. Understand where your weaknesses are. So the next part is where are you less good? What are the things you're not so good at? The technical gaps you might have at the moment and the opportunity you have, because a lot of you guys are still students, the opportunity you have to fill those gaps. If you run a company, right, you might not be the best at sales and marketing and the technical staff and the HR staff and the risk staff. You need to have a base level of knowledge of all those things, but you don't need to be an expert in them all. When I got my first head coaching gig, 
in American football. I'm pretty good on offense, I'm pretty good on special teams, not that good on defense, so I brought in somebody that was great at defense. You could fill those gaps around about you by the network you build. But in order to do that, you need to be honest and you need to understand where am I strong and where do I need to get better. Make sense? Beautiful, so that's a good starting point. Which of those things are the most pressing to fill? So some of them, like I say, will be fatal. Like if you don't know how to, say you, like I, I worked in corporate life, I worked for the Royal Bank of Scotland, which is now NatWest, for 15 years. And last summer I left and went on my own, okay? So the hard skills that I had in math in the job, you know, presenting, coaching, all that sort of stuff, they were the things that were gonna serve me well. But I also needed to do business development. I needed to get work. Okay, so if I didn't have those skills and I didn't develop those skills, that would be fatal. I could be the best coach in the world. If I've got nobody to coach, I'm not gonna make any money. Yeah, then I can't keep the lights on. So what are the things that are fatal if you don't have them and make sure you work to develop those skills? And what are the areas where you could probably bring somebody in? Things like media and marketing type stuff. I can do enough to get by. This spicy looking presentation, I paid somebody else to put it together. Not actually the content, obviously, like I wrote that myself. But the, the framework, the outline, yeah? My website, I can do website design, not very well. I paid somebody else to do that, you know? That's how you start thinking about it. What are the things that are fatal that I need to learn? What are the things I can kind of outsource, I can bring people in to work on? And then the last bit, and this is something I do with every single person I coach, and I've coached hundreds of executives, senior managers over the years, both in the bank and since I left, I'm working with people in places like Citibank, HSBC, doing a couple of gigs back in that west again that's one thing you'll find if you work for a big corporate then you leave then you end up going back as a consultant and getting paid more than you got paid when you're there that's that's what corporate life's all about uh, i work with groups of teachers i work with loads and loads of different people house builders all sorts of different groups and one of the questions i asked them for a start is if the group of people right there's a group up here when i was i was over here in your chat they were talking about oh well i sent the photos from last night to the group chat who was that where's the guys a group of girls probably up there somewhere they were chatting they pretend they've been coy now right but the group of people round about you, ask yourself the question, if they had a reunion in 10 years time, what would they say about you? Interesting question. This isn't just about corporate life. This isn't just about the team that you lead. It could be about your family. It could be about your friends. It could be about your social circle at university. What would they say about you? What would they remember about you if they had a 10 year reunion and you couldn't make it? And what would you like them to say about you? And where are those gaps? What are the things that you need to do in order to become the kind of person that you want to be in that group? And this is important in all aspects of your life. My, the love of my life is Harper Alice Davies, my six-year-old daughter, right? She is the cutest little person you've ever met in your life. And my job is to be the best dad I can be for her, you know? Because I can go out and spend my time doing lots of things, but she can only get one dad, that's it. So I've got to do a good job of that, right? So I think to myself, what kind of dad do I want to be? How do I want her to remember me when I'm you know, old and gone as a dad? I need to be present, I need to be focused on her, I need to be attentive. So what are the behaviors I need to exhibit in order to be remembered like that? Make sense? Do these audits on the different parts of your life and do them now, you guys are young, young and fresh faced. You could be, I mean, you're wearing masks, you're maybe not fresh faced, but you've got fresh eyes. <laughs> you know, take this opportunity to think about the type of person you want to become, the type of leader you want to become, you know, the type of business you want to build, all those sorts of things, all right? Make sense? Beautiful, okay, next up, vision and purpose. Understand your vision and purpose, shape that vision, lead with it, share it. So first of all, why are you doing what you're doing? You guys are all here for a reason. You've all given up time to come. A lot of you, how many of you are not from London? Right, so most of you guys are like me. You've traveled down for this. So you've come here for a reason. There's a reason you want to be around these people, listen to these speakers, a part of this event. Think about why you do what you do. What are you driven by? What's your vision? What's your mission? What is your purpose? Yeah, I'm not expecting you to come up with it right now, but spend some time while you're young thinking about the stuff that really matters to you. Where are you trying to go, okay? And what are the things that you'll need to do in order to be successful? This is how it works, right? You set out your vision for you're trying to get to, you build the goals, and if you achieve those goals, it'll deliver your vision, and then you build the plans to deliver the goals. It's that simple, okay? The typical bit is working out the vision first of all. There's a great tool out there called Ikigai. Have you heard of that? I-K-I-G-A-I, -I right? Look it up on, do a Google search of it. It's a Japanese thing, it's about your reason for being it. Thinking about what are you good at? What do you love? What does the world need? What could you get paid for? Think about some of those things, right? And then think about your vision versus the vision of the company that you're a part of, or that you're building, or that you want to be a part of. Because lots of people find themselves in their lives working for an organization, and they have a personal vision that doesn't align with that of the organization. You know, they're a very altruistic person. They want to make a difference in the world, and they find themselves working for an organization that just wants to line its pockets. 
and that wears you down pretty quickly. You guys are very, very lucky in that you're interested in a sector that has every opportunity right now to do incredible things. You guys have seen some of the stuff that's gone on with satellites in the kind of Ukraine-Russia crisis over the last couple of weeks, yeah? You guys will be very familiar with some of the stuff that's going on with satellites in terms of looking at how the rainforests are being depleted, looking at, you know, the polar ice caps, looking at global warming, looking at the migrant crisis. There are huge opportunities in the space sector to do things that are significant and meaningful in this world, yeah? not just lying in your pockets. You might lie in your pockets along the way, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with making money, but if you're driven to do something meaningful and your organization is only driven to lie in its pockets and its shareholders' pockets, eventually that'll start to grate with you. So make sure you think about that, okay? Then think about your elevator pitch. If you met somebody in an elevator and you had one floor to explain to them what it is that you're all about, what would you say? How would that sound? Yeah, spend some time thinking about it. Next. When you have a vision, it makes leading much easier, okay? Because you lead with your vision. Have you ever read Start With Why by Simon Sinek? Yeah, great book, well worth a look. He talks about recruiting it. So when you recruit people in the organization, you're usually like, these are the specific tasks you'll do. That's the what. What you should be leading with is, this is what we're about. This is why this organization exists. This is what we're trying to achieve, you know? Use that to fire people up. And when you're Recruiting and when you're prioritizing with it, it means that you spend your time on the things that are important. People are like, oh, I've not got time for that, or actually I can't afford that. That's bullshit. You've got time and money for the things you choose to spend your time and money on. Yeah? And your vision helps you prioritize where you spend your time and your money. Okay? So use that to prioritize. And then when you're thinking about scaling, if you've got an organization, you're trying to make it grow. If there's me, I make all the decisions, it's easy. They're always going to be in line with my vision. Then I recruit you. So now you're making decisions when I'm not there. So you need to be absolutely bought into the vision so that the decisions are made in the same line. Then I recruit you. And now you're making decisions over here and I'm making decisions over here. And the danger is I don't let anything go. I have to make all the decisions. Well, that's not scalable. If I want to scale an organization, I need to have a vision that is clear, that is embedded across the organization so that everyone's making decisions in the same line. Does that make sense? Yeah? This is why vision is important. It's about making decisions and being aligned. There's a great book called Will It Make the Boat Go Faster? A roar called Ben Hunt Davis. And he was speaking at a couple of Olympics. They were going to the third Olympics. They decided we need to do something different. So they had this phrase, will it make the boat go faster? Do you want to go out for a couple of pints tonight? Is that going to make the boat go faster? No, I'll be hungover. I'll miss training tomorrow. I'll be fatter. I'll be way more. Fat people, slow boat, yeah? You say, do you want to get up at five tomorrow and have a, a, an extra couple hours rowing? Will that make the boat go faster? Probably. That's how your vision helps you scale, yeah? We all have the same vision, we're all aligned, we move forward together. And then delegate with it. Give people work and show them how the thing that you're being asked to do ties into the bigger picture. Yeah, three pillars of intrinsic motivation, autonomy, mastery, purpose. Help people get great, give them the flexibility and show them what the, th the thing they're doing matters and why it matters, all right? And then share it, cosmic ordering, that's kind of space, there you go. Cosmic ordering is a thing that Noel Edmonds spoke about years ago. And I heard it, I was like, that's a lot of shite, Noel. But basically, it was like, he's like, I just decide what I want and I just order it from the cosmos. And that's how I get. And I was like, I don't think that's a thing. No, I don't think that's a real thing. But when you know where you're trying to get to, you're able to talk about your vision, talk about your mission, talk about your purpose. And incredibly then, another pair of ears, another pair of eyes know what you're all about. And they look for the things that you need. And they put you in touch with people. When I started my business, I had all these conversations. Go on. Help. All right, just fill your boots, sir. Quite nice slides on. I spent a lot of money on those. Uh, <laughs> the um, <coughs> the idea is that cosmic order. When I left the, the corporate life and had my own business, right, it was like every conversation I had, I said, "This is what I'm trying to do. I want to be an executive coach. I want to do leadership development, and I want to do speaking gigs. These are the three things I've been doing professionally. Three things I love." And at the end of every conversation, I'd say, "Who do you know that it would benefit me to talk to?" Not who can give me money, who can give me work, just who would it benefit me to talk to? And that spreads and spreads and spreads, and before you know it, you've got opportunities, all right? Okay, up next. This is huge and very relevant to what we have today. That's how it's not, it's the next slide, we're one ahead of ourselves. Okay, motivation, this is always relevant anyway. Two types of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic, stuff that comes from inside you versus things that you're given. You know, extrinsic is like money, wealth, power, all that kind of stuff. So what you need to do in order to use this is to know the people that you're trying to influence. Understand what motivates them, understand what drives them, and know the things that you have access to, what tools, skills, resources, you know, networks do you have, and put those two things together, you know? 
If I know someone's driven by money and I've got a way to make them money, that's going to motivate them. If I know someone's driven by the opportunity to make a difference in the world and I've got an opportunity that could help them do that, that's going to motivate them. Put the things together. Yeah, whenever you're trying to influence somebody, it's all about understanding does what I have and what I'm interested in align with theirs, yeah? That's how motivation works. And then at the bottom, harness people's emotion, right? Especially in some of the topics I discussed when I was standing over there, right? There are some really big, powerful topics you have the opportunity to influence. So you need to think about what will it feel like if we succeed and make a difference in these things? But also what will it feel like, what might it mean to the, to the world if we're not successful, okay? Don't be frightened to use fear as a motivator. Don't use it all the time. Yeah, you can't just motivate people with fear all the time. But if it's like, if we don't do this, this is where we're going to end up. With things like the climate crisis, that's kind of a, a reality that we have to face. You know, it's not a case of it would be nice if we did some of these things. If we don't do them, we'll be fucked. Yeah, and so we need to do them. And drive that home as a motivator. Indulge in the fantasy of success and dwell on the reality of failure. This is your weekend here, okay? Networking is absolutely massive. There's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. Do you know who Jeb Bush is? Jeb Bush was once, I heard Jeb Bush being interviewed, he was standing for a lecture, I can't remember if it was a, if he was going for president or if it was just one of the kind of more localized options. He described himself as a self-made man. Jeb Bush by this point had a brother and a dad who had both been president of the United States of America, right? Literally the least self-made man in the history of men, okay? There isn't such a thing as a self-made man. You're standing on the shoulders of giants. You guys are at the 34th annual convention, yeah? There'd be 33 before. So the people that organized this did a hell of a job and they learned from the people that came before. Every one of you comes along, you learn from the lecturers, from the people you're around about. We're all building on what comes before us. So think about your stakeholder map. Who's on it? Imagine you in the middle, your academic contacts, your professional contacts, your social contacts, your contacts and hobbies. Who's on that map? Okay. Draw it all up. Be clear about who's on there. And then do an audit. How healthy are these relationships? Are they brilliant? Are they basic? Are they broken? Basic is like, yeah, we know each other, we get on fine. Broken is like, he thinks I'm a tube. Yeah, I could probably do more to build that. Or I know who he is, but he doesn't know who I am. And brilliant is, yeah, we've got a great two-way relationship. We support one another. We help each other out, okay? And then think about who do you not yet know? And this is what this weekend should be about for you guys. Who's not yet on your network that you want to have on your network by the end of the weekend? What companies do you want to influence? What people, what lecturers, what speakers do you want to influence? How do you get them as part of your network to be able to leverage the resources they have access to? Okay? And come up with a plan for it. What is your plan to get to know them? Be yourself. Think about what tools do I have? What things do I have access to that I could take to them? Experience, knowledge, energy, passion, enthusiasm. You know, take those things. That's what you guys have got just now. Bring them to the table. And then how do you strengthen the links? How do you make sure that those people who their relationships aren't good, you work to make them good? Yeah? Put in the time, put in the effort, come up with a plan. Networking, developing your links, developing your, your kind of nodes on this map is really, really important because that's how you'll get things done. All sensible? Any of you guys got a, a, a stakeholder map drawn up? Come around to my house, 38 Marchman Gardens in Balerno, I'll show you mine. It's on a whiteboard. Yeah, I show people that they're like, you've actually drawn that up. I was like, you're damn right I've drawn it up. I'm very clear who I need to influence. These are organizations with whom I could potentially do some interesting stuff. So they're on my, my map. I need to keep them warm. Haven't heard from you in a while. Here's an article you might be interested in. I remember the last time we spoke, he discussed this topic. Here's a book I read that covers it. I think you'd really like it. I spoke to this other guy. I think you two would get on really well. Be the connector, yeah? You'd be amazed where that gets you. Use the resources you have at your disposal. Balcony versus dance. The idea is that when you're, you're in the early parts of your career, you're on the dance floor cutting shapes, yeah? You're doing the dancing, right? As you get a little bit more senior, you climb up on the balcony, you're observing the dance. You can see who's not dancing, who's not doing it effectively. Where's the dance going? What's on the horizon, yeah? That's the difference between doing and leading. And as you become more senior, you'll do less doing and you'll do more leading. And the transition's difficult because generally it's the doing that makes you successful. You're the guy who does this thing. You're really good at this thing. It's like, well, now if I'm not doing it, I won't be the good guy anymore. Like, I'll, I'll be doing a thing I'm not so good at. And that's tough for people. Or it's like, actually, my team aren't very good. They're not as good as me. So I'll just keep doing, you know, and just take all the autonomy away from them. I'll keep doing and actually just stifle them because, you know, I do it better than them anyway. That's what happens in leadership. You see it all the time. So think about it. There's a fishing problem because people come and they're like, oh, do you want me to do that? You're like, in the time it would take me to teach you how to do it, I'd be quicker just doing it myself. So I'll just give you a fish rather than teach you how to fish. But becoming a great coach and learning how to develop people 
and to share your experience and your knowledge and your talent with others is a hugely powerful way of being able to scale. So thinking at the bottom, in order to delegate effectively, you've got to make sure the vision and the purpose are clear. Yeah, so that people understand why you're there doing what you're asking them to do. And make sure they're regularly reinforced. With vision, we have the Ask Anyone test. Can anyone guess what the Ask Anyone test is? The clues in the title. You should be able to ask anyone. If we're an organization, I come to you and say, what's our vision? You can't tell me. That's a reflection of me as the leader, not you as the person there. You've got to reinforce this stuff all the time. Make sure people know exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. Make sure they're bought in, and that makes delegation much easier. Delegate things that free your time and give people meaningful stretch. Don't just delegate the shit you don't want to do, because people see that. I remember when I was a graduate in the bank, it was like, I've got a development opportunity for you. I was like, oh, development opportunity, brilliant. I'd love to be developed, that would be great. And then like a day later, I found myself in this empty office, moving filing cabinets. And I was like, this is not a development opportunity. I've been shafted here, you know? Give people meaningful stuff to do, because I very quickly lost faith in that leader. And then when you're doing it, think about, are they clear about what they've been asked to do? And you, uh, how do you find out if somebody's clear about something? You ask them. You don't say, are you clear? Because then what happens? And then they walk away and they're like, I don't know what to do. I need to go find out. So say, talk to me about what it is I've asked you to do. You know, when you'll feed back to me, what the expectations are. Get them to, cl to clarify it back to you. In terms of checking their capability, observe them, coach them. Make sure that they're actually capable of what you're asking them to do. And if they're not, help them become capable by coaching. And then finally, make sure they under you understand their motivation like we spoke about and tie it all in. All right? <clears throat> and then follow up. Inspect what you expect. Say thank you. So... There you go. Here's the ask. Think about your vision. Spend some time working out what your vision is. Where are you trying to get to? What's important to you in your life? Okay? Professionally, personally, socially, all that good stuff. Share it and use it like a magnet. Draw people in with it. Find like-minded people. You become the average of the five people you spend your time with. You guys have probably have heard that before. It's a Jim Rohn quote. Is it totally accurate? I have no idea. But you can understand the sentiment behind it. You spend your time with people that are motivated and driven by the same things. It G's you up. Practice. Where can you practice the skills you'll need in leadership? Your communication skills, influencing, networking, interpersonal stuff, okay? Find ways to practice those now so that when you are in big kind of senior roles in the future, you've got those skills locked in. The 10-year reunion. Ask yourself those questions. What will people think about you? What would they say? What would you like them to say? And how can you find out the gaps? And then finally, your stakeholder map. Draw it up. Work out who's on there. How do you strengthen those? How do you keep them warm? Who's not on there and how do you get them on there? Make sense? Right, questions. Let's do it. Look, I see the timing. We're all over this. Four minutes ahead of time. My God, this Matt Davies guy, honestly. Unbelievable. What we got? Questions. I knew this row would have questions. I'm not technical enough. Um, at what point do you stop trying to strengthen a relationship that clearly is not a two-sided equal back and forth? Oh, so great question. If the, if the relationship is broken because someone's just taken advantage of you, that's a different story. Yeah, there comes a point when it's like, you know, do, is there anything that I need so desperately that I can only get it from this one person? And if there's not, Life's too short to waste your time with people like that. Yeah. It's all about your own self-worth as well. You know what I mean? Like constantly going over to be a doormat, to be trodden all over by somebody. It's not good for you. Find other ways around it. Find other ways around it. But ultimately, it's sometimes these things come from a misunderstanding. They come because, you know, they are... They, sometimes it comes because they think you're going to do that to them. You know, they think you're going to take advantage of them. So showing the value you bring to relationships. I always go in with a view of I trust somebody until they prove, give me a reason not to. Some people go in with the opposite, like I won't trust you until you've proven you're trustworthy. You know, that's up to you how you approach it. But I always go in with best intentions. You know, assume good intentions from everyone. And then if they give you a reason not to, then you reassess and you potentially find another avenue. Other questions? What else we got? Another one at the end of the row. And then we've got one far over there. Um, so... How do you deal with people who 
where their motivations just are so misaligned with your own, uh, and assuming you can't bin them off, obviously. <coughs> That's a difficult thing because ultimately, you know, you need to. So within the corporate world, there's a phrase that says, "Help them find their happiness elsewhere." You can imagine what that means, right? But ultimately, if you have people around about you whose motivations are totally out of line with your own or out of line with the organization, they're never going to find that happiness. There's always going to be that tension I've spoken about. So you need to think about ways to help them actually understand and recognize that and come to the realization that perhaps their skills, their tools, their resources, their passions would be better placed elsewhere, you know? And we've seen that a lot over the, the last couple of years of the pandemic when people are like, why am I working for this company? You know, I should start a bakery. Most people just started bakeries. That was it. It was like 10 years ago, like every single person I had on Facebook had like a, was like a nail technician. It's like the whole British economy was like supported by nails and eyelashes. It's like, that's what I want to do. It's fine. If that's what you're passionate about, that's what brings you joy, go and find a way to make it happen, you know? So just have an open, honest conversations with people. Don't skirt around these things. In corporate life, people, and this is big and small corporate, we're, we're so focused on the task that this needs done and this needs done, that we don't spend time to get to know the people. What really drives them? What motivates them? How do they like to be managed? How do they like to be motivated and supported and developed? Find those things out and have these open and honest conversations. Somebody on the far side? Hi. So, um, obviously, like, networking is all about, like, being out there, just being straightforward and talking to people. But at what point is it, like, too obvious or, like, too awkward to just go and be too obvious about trying to just make build a network. I uh, got networking training when I was a graduate. I did two graduate schemes. That shows how good I was as a graduate. I had to go back and do it again, right? Uh, I did two graduate schemes and we got, and it was like, go up to them and say first name, full name. Hi, Matt, Matt Davies, right? Don't ever do any of that stuff because you look like an absolute bell end, all right? <laughs> the way to network effectively is to find mutual areas of interest. You know, things you can do to help that person. Or just go up and say, I thought your presentation was excellent. I'd really love to follow you and find out more about what you do. You know, or, uh, you know, I really like this particular thing you spoke about. Where can I learn more about it? You know, show interest. It's the <coughs> Networking is like when you're out on the pool, right? <laughs> so you're in a bar and you're chatting to a girl and she's like, oh, I love dogs. And you're like, oh, great. Yeah, oh, I just loved, love dogs. I'm like, Mr. Dogs. Just go to the toilet and then you just download a picture of a dog and you come back. This is actually, this is Fifi. This is my dog, right? You know, it's like. What's interesting to you is fascinating to me. Don't do that, by the way. That's terrible. Don't ever do that. But the idea is you find things that are interesting to them and you make genuine, meaningful connections. A lot of people network with the most senior person in the room. Like, that's the only way to do it. You know, like, unless it's Jesus, I'm not going to waste my time, you know, going speaking to them, right? There's no point in that. Build meaningful relationships that are beneficial in both directions because people see right through it. You know, I mean, everyone gra like in graduate graduate schemes, like everyone just gravitated towards the senior people. The senior people were just like, oh, "Come on, you know, F build meaningful relationships where there's where there's give and take." You know, Stephen Covey, think win win. If you've never read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, just read that book and it'll change your life. It's phenomenal. That's just the time. Two more minutes. Oh, beautiful. Any more questions? No question here. You know, there's no question. By the way, just before you answer this, or ask this, I'm here all day. This is my presentation and I've got nothing else to do the rest of the day. I was going to go to the bass gallery, but it's shot on a Sunday, so <laughs> can't even go and buy a bass guitar. So I'll be here all day. So if you want to ask any questions or chat, give me a shout. Go for it. So I wanted to ask about um, career changing. So I'm in the Scottish middle. accent. Good work. Yes, good start. I'm, I'm actually also from Balerno. Are you? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I live there. That's um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm, um, I'm in the process of moving from politics to space, the space sector. I actually work for your MP. And um, I wondered, how do you make use of like existing networks and things that you've built up, relationships, that kind of thing, in a totally new sector? Let them know what you're doing, for a start. Like, let these people know what you're doing, because you never know what contacts they have. Like, the whole space thing's funny. So, <coughs> you guys, if you guys heard of Skyrora? Right, I did some work for Skyrora because my mate Daniel worked for them, right? Have you heard of Astro Agency? Right, Daniel owns Astro Agency, so I do some work for them as well. That's how I'm here. That's how this all came about. My leadership stuff exists, you know, out in the world, but I know Daniel, and he's like, oh, actually, you should come and speak at Space Bar. That would be really, really good because he knows what I do because I talk about what I do. So it's just basically a cosmic ordering thing. Use the contacts. Let them know what you're doing. Let them know what you're up to. 
tell them interesting things you found out that might be relevant to their world and use that to kind of find your way in, you know? That's all it is, is just, just let people know. And then before you know it, you've got this whole network of people that are like, oh, that girl used to work with us. She's in the space. And she'd, she'd benefit from knowing this person. They tie it all together. They become connectors for each other. It's amazing how it happens, honestly. Like I got work, loads of work over the last six months that's come from just that. I speak to one person. I mention what I'm doing. They put me in touch with somebody else. They put me in touch with somebody else. The person messages and says, I've got 20 days of coaching for you. I'm like, holy shit, how's that come about? You know, it's just, honestly, it's incredible. And that's just letting people know what you're all about. Look, what you're looking for. What do you care about? And, and equally, just finding ways to help other people. Yeah. One more? Go for it. Um, so I think it's quite topical for a lot of people in the UK said to this one. Um, so how would you, like, what advice would you have for balancing, like, delegating effectively, like, to a team? while not only safeguarding like the work-life balance of them but also of yourself because I feel like a lot of the time like especially that friend like well like leaders eat last and I feel like it you feel very responsible to pick up the slack and do a lot of the work but that can come at expense of like your own work-life balance absolutely well. good reference to leaders eat last by Simon Sinek another great book reference to my favorite books always a winner so work-life balance is such a big topic these days and it's something you have to be conscious of and you have to recognize that it's not really a balance it's never a balance like I have times when I'm knocking my pan and doing 10 15 hour days and other times when I'm just like take the afternoon off and just go on a sesh you know like it's just finding those ebbs and flows the first thing with delegating and the work-life balance of your people is those conversations we spoke about get to know people understand what's important to them you know understand how they're feeling how you doing like I did some work this week with another organization, a group of really young people actually from, they're based all over, they're, they're all kind of Eastern European, but they're now based out in like Bali and Thailand because the company lets them work for anywhere. And so they've got a good balance in terms of being able to be flexible, but they're all working like 15 hour days, you know? And they're like, well, we're young, we've not got families, we've not got kids, all that kind of stuff, so we can do it. And I was like, you can do it. And if you're choosing to do it, that's absolutely fine. Because some people are like that. Some people want to fill their days with work but there are other people who don't. So I think understanding your people for a start is a really important thing. Understanding what their workload looks like, what their capacity is, what their availability is. Also, give the work to the people that are good at it, you know, in order that it's done in the most effective and efficient way. Put your players in a position to be successful. Think about things like that. But conversations are really, really important. Be open, be honest, you know. A guy was having this conversation with Daniel who uh, owns Astro Agency because he works ludicrous hours. What happened to Daniel on Thursday? became a dad for the first time and I said Daniel things are about to change my man you can't do that you know and that's what's going to be an interesting thing in his life so you know those things can change you but preparing before they do and just understanding you know uh, what sort of capacity people have and sometimes this is one of the most important things that I didn't cover on the slides say no you know what I mean like you know I, I, had, a, I had a message um, came in yesterday like can you deliver this leadership session next Saturday um, in London and I was like I'm out in the session in Newcastle with the boys so no I can't it would have been quite lucrative might have led to more work and I hate turning down work like I like being busy and I like you know putting a roof over my head but some things have just got to be balanced in order to make sure that the work I do do is of a good standard because there's the law of diminishing returns you know when you do like an all-nighter to write that essay and everyone's like at uni they think they're like Billy Big Boss, because they've done like a 12 hour all nighter to like write an essay. And I was like, see, after about midnight, the stuff you wrote was shit. Don't kid yourself otherwise, right? You could have got up at nine o'clock this morning and done that five hours worth of work in an hour and a half, okay? So the law of diminishing returns comes in as well. We have time off work to replenish and rejuvenate and refresh ourselves so that when we're at work, we're effective. And don't remember that, don't forget that, yeah? Look after yourselves. Because that's the other thing with work, and this will be the last thing I'll say, right? I did this presentation to graduates every year for the last 10 years in the bank, right? And I always said this to them. If you go under a bus tomorrow, your company will replace you by the end of the month. If you go under the bus tomorrow, how's your daughter going to replace you? You know? How's your mum and dad going to replace you? There are people out there that you owe your well-being to beyond yourself. And I can tell you it's not your employers. All right? Here end of the sermon. Thank you very much.
Thank you so, so very much, Matt. I think we would all love to have you for even longer, but we do have to continue on with the day with some more fantastic talks coming up. As Matt suggested, if you want to find him, he will be around the venue. You can talk to him. You can ask him any more questions you want. In here, we're going to have Professor Mark McCorkin talk about, uh, talk about the James Webb Telescope in just a moment. And across the road in stream two, we're going to have Dr. Stephanie Yardley.
and the science it involves. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me to come and give this talk today. First time I've been in the UK for two years, so uh, I live over the water in the Netherlands where the European Space Agency has its uh, main technical center. So I'm going to talk about one telescope today, but of course the European Space Agency has a whole range of missions. Um, these are our solar system missions. It's arranged into three rows, so at the bottom are the missions which are what we call legacy missions which finish their operations, but all of the data is still available in archives. <clears throat> so there are many there you'll recognize, and perhaps the one which, uh, <clears throat> for some of you in the audience maybe, even considering it was now almost eight years ago, uh, the Rosetta mission may have been an inspiration to some of you in coming into space science. It was a huge privilege to have worked on that mission um, back in 2014 to 2016. Uh, and then in the middle, we have missions which are currently flying. So we have a, mission, a couple of missions at Mars. We have a mission, Bethy Colombo, on its way to Mercury, uh, and a whole range of missions studying the sun. And then at the top, we have missions which are yet to fly, uh, so what we call in development. And uh, the, the next big launch in the solar system uh, area is JUICE, going to Jupiter and the icy moons, Callisto, Ganymede, and uh, Europa. We have an equivalent chart for our astrophysics um, and uh, fundamental physics missions. So again, at the bottom, the things which finished operations, uh, and they're two of the big things that uh, were launched just before I joined ESA in 2009 were Herschel and Planck. Uh, and they were cryogenic infrared missions. Uh, and that's relevant to today's talk. They both had liquid hydrogen, <coughs> uh, liquid helium rather, um, in their uh, cooling systems in order to get them very cold, but that ran out after a while. And the James Webb Space Telescope, which I'm going to talk about today, has a rather different cooling system and doesn't, uh, doesn't have a lifetime that's fixed by liquid cryogens. And then missions in the middle, high energy missions, integral XMN Newton, uh, Gaia, which has been at the moment uh, producing more papers in the world than any other space telescope or any observatory, measuring the positions and motions of stars in our Milky Way to extraordinary precision. It was launched in 2013, uh, and then I put JWST there, as you'll see <coughs> in the rest of this talk. And then missions yet to come. So exoplanets are a big topic at ESA, Plato and Ariel, dark energy, dark matter, with the Euclid mission due to be launched next year. Uh, and then, again, high energy missions. And in the deeper future, LISA, a gravitational wave observatory, which we are uh, beginning to build now. <coughs> so let's talk about this. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, the real thing on the right-hand side, uh, folded up in its launch configuration at our um, uh, Kourou Launch Center in French Guiana. Uh, and that's in November when I was lucky enough to go down and we did a big media trip down there, took some people down to show the observatory in this final state before it was encapsulated in the fairing of the Ariane 5. But this project started a long time ago and this book you see here on the left hand side is the proceedings of a scientific conference held in 1989 and that was already three or four years into the mission in terms of its development talking about what was called at that point the next generation space telescope and any old people in the audience and there are a few I see sorry I'm not going to look at people specific I'll get myself in trouble um, <coughs> I'm certainly old enough to remember that lots of things in the 1980s were called the next generation thing and that's all to do with Star Trek, Star Trek and the Next Generation. Loads of astronomers watched Star Trek and lots of things got called the Next Generation, this, that, and the other. Um, and it got renamed in about 2000, uh, James Webb Space Telescope for the administrator of NASA who was administrator during the Apollo landings. But I have to say my email folder, uh, which is rather big and rather full after 24 years working on the project, is still called NGST. I've just not, never got used to the new name. It's taken, I'm never going to, but... Uh, so I'm going to talk you through what it is that led us to propose this mission to NASA, to ESA, European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency, and why it is this machine looks very different to the Hubble Space Telescope. So let's start right at the very beginning. Astronomy. Uh, with a naked eye, astronomy in dark places, and London is not one of those. Um, it didn't help it was cloudy last night, but you probably don't see the Milky Way very clearly from London, but get out into the countryside, get to somewhere dark. Um, you can see the things that we know now from studying in astronomy, you can see with the naked eye. You can see that we live in a galaxy, the Milky Way. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, this is from New Zealand, you can also see there are galaxies near to us, the large and small Magellanic clouds on the left-hand side of the picture. 
But there's only so far that naked eye astronomy can take us. And over um, the years since Galileo first invented uh, the telescope and started turning that to the stars, in the 400 years or so since then, we've got to the point where we build huge machines like this. This is one of, oh, doesn't like that picture, okay. So this is one of the four eight meter diameter telescopes called the Very Large Telescope. We're very prosaic in astronomy. Uh, the VLT, which sits on uh, Cerro Paranal in the Chilean Atacama. The smaller telescopes you see there on the, on the left-hand side are part of the interferometer array, VLTI. So by combining the light from these four giant telescopes, the other three are here on this side, and the small telescopes, we can get the resolution of a 200 meter diameter telescope from the ground. Very often, telescopes are built on tops of mountains, and one particular mountain with lots of telescopes is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And you can see here on the left-hand side um, the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope, as it was called in those days, and that's actually where I got my PhD, uh, working on that telescope, which, and, and the work I did on that telescope with infrared detectors, the first infrared cameras in astronomy, led directly to my involvement in James Webb Space Telescope. So that goes all the way back to the early 80s. And then there are some very big telescopes which were built more recently. And just as a personal anecdote, because I'm an astronomer and I'm a geek, I actually got married on the summit of this mountain. So uh, I think the first people ever to get married up there um, in 1990. So this is Mauna Kea. And one of the reasons you go to Mauna Kea is at 4,000 meters altitude, it's above much of the water in the Earth's atmosphere. And that water is particularly bad when you're observing at infrared wavelengths because water absorbs infrared light very effectively. So the more water you can get above, the better you are in the infrared. But of course, there are nights when you can do your best, but there's water over your head. There's clouds. Even on Mauna Kea, it can be cloudy some of the time. Uh, so this is a rather dramatic night, uh, the Subaru telescope there in the foreground. But even when the sky is clear and you're high at high altitude, you still have to contend with stuff like this. This is not easily seen with the naked eye, but ast astronomical telescopes and cameras can see this stuff. This is air glow. This is the atmosphere at 80 kilometers altitude glowing due to atomic uh, uh, the ex excitation of atoms and molecules by sunlight during the daytime, and then that decays away at nighttime. And these waves that you see here, um, and this is the hydroxyl molecule at 80 kilometers, those are actually being driven by thunderstorms tens of thousands, thousands or tens of thousands even, kilometers away, propagating gravity waves in the, in the upper atmosphere. And that is not only bright for professional telescopes, but also is changing rapidly as those waves propagate. And that makes the background go up and down, it makes it difficult to get stable images. Now, the other thing that happens on, at a ground-based telescope is ground-based telescopes are warm. Ground-based telescopes give out infrared light. And just to sort of illustrate that with something here from London, some thermographic pictures looking at 10 microns wavelength and looking at things glowing, so buildings, people, uh, glowing at those wavelengths, and telescopes glow at those wavelengths as well. And that's not a great thing if you're trying to observe at those wavelengths. You've got the atmosphere bright and glowing down the telescope tube at the same time as you're trying to see extremely faint things. So you have to contend with the water in the atmosphere, you have to contend with clouds, you have to contend with the stuff that you're actually trying to observe with, your telescope actually glowing. And that's not a great thing. And of course, on top of that, you have this, this thing called seeing, atmospheric turbulence, which can cause the images uh, to shimmer and move around. And if you look very carefully at this movie, you can actually see it's moving differentially. Everything's not all moving together. There are patches which move separately from others. And that's to do with a thing called the coherence length, over what distance or angular scale is the atmosphere moving coherently. And it's not very large. Um, you, there are small patches you can correct, and you can correct that using adaptive optics. So you can make artificial guide stars up at 80 kilometers using that same layer, but this time using sodium. You can excite that layer with lasers like this, um, make artificial stars and monitor their positions. And by moving mirrors around to stabilize those positions, you can stabilize images from coming from outer space, but only over a limited field of view because the atmosphere isn't coherent over large scales. So, obviously, one way to get around all of that stuff is to go to space. It's not easy to go to space because you have to have rockets. You have to build things that can survive 8 to 15 minutes of intense vibration and shaking. 
tend to be extremely expensive because of that driving of technology, the way that you have to lightweight everything. Big ground-based telescopes can be hundreds or thousands of tons, but space telescopes are only a few tons, and getting all of that technology crammed into a small object takes an awful lot of very clever engineering. So this is April 1990. Uh, I was a postdoc working in Arizona at that point, working on a second generation instrument for the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the launch went well, but of course we found that the mirror was not in the right shape uh, soon after launch. The mirror had been polished perfectly against a bad piece of test equipment. But Hubble was repaired, and Hubble has had a very long lifetime generating a huge amount of very exciting science. Uh, this is in 2009 after some of the instruments had been replaced, the mirror had been corrected, the uh, gyros had been changed, the solar panels. That was all possible because Hubble is in low Earth orbit at just around 500 kilometers. It's been visited multiple times in, when they were still flying by space shuttles. Astronauts went outside, pulled instruments out, plugged new things in, and it was designed for that. It was designed to be serviced. And that made Hubble a very uh, adaptable long-term telescope. But it's not in a very good place um, next to the Earth, as you'll hear in a moment. But some of the things that Hubble has done, um, it's, it's done science that it was never designed for. For example, looking at the atmospheres of exoplanets, but it's been adaptable and has done that. But this is one of the main things that Hubble is well known for, the so-called deep fields, or the ultra-deep fields as they've become, as we've penetrated deeper and deeper into the universe by taking an image, pointing at one place, and stacking images lasting up to a month in observing time. We can see galaxies relatively close by in the nearby universe, and then as we see the smaller, fainter, and redder galaxies, we're looking back further away from the Earth, and because of the finite speed of light, we're looking further back in time. So what we see as we look at the fainter galaxies further away, we see them changing. We see their properties being different from the ones, the galaxies around us. They tend to have more high mass stars. They tend to be forming stars more rapidly. We're seeing the evolution of galaxies over time as we look further away. But we also know from the expansion of the universe that Hubble, for whom the telescope is named, discovered, that the universe actually has a finite age. We know that the universe is around 13.8 billion years old. It's expanding, and because it's expanding today, in the past, it must have been smaller. And we can reverse that motion, and we can say, how old is the universe? 13.8 billion years. So at some point, we're going to look far enough away, and therefore far enough back, that we're going to see the first galaxies, the first objects that formed in our universe. Now, it turns out we, can, we don't know where they are yet, because in these images, the further and further we look away, the fainter and fainter we look, we see more galaxies. We keep seeing galaxies in these images with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, we know that there's something happening between those galaxies, which we can see, and what we see coming from the Big Bang. The Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, has been mapped by many telescopes, but this is our European Space Agency Planck mission which operated from 2009 to 2013, and made this beautiful image of what is called the cosmic microwave background, the light left over from the universe when it was just 400,000 years old. At that point, the universe was 3,000 Kelvin. It was the, at that point, when it was, it was cooling down as the universe was expanding, electrons and protons could come together finally. They, the temperature was just low enough that that could happen. The universe became transparent. All of the photons that have been trapped in the cloud of plasma could then stream out freely. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a map of the lumps and bumps at a roughly a few millionths of a degree Kelvin superimposed on a three Kelvin background. It was 3,000 at that point, but today we see it at three Kelvin because of the redshift, the expansion of the universe. So we see these lumps and bumps. These are the things that gave rise to galaxies the things we see in the Hubble images, but we can't yet connect the two. We can't see how those lumps and bumps started forming galaxies to see the ones we see in the Hubble images. So we have theoretical ideas what those galaxies must have looked like. We believe they should be very different from the galaxies that Hubble sees and the galaxies in the universe today, because when the universe was born, it only had hydrogen and helium. It didn't have any carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, what we call metals in astronomy. Now, many metallurgists don't call carbon and oxygen and nitrogen metals, but anything other than hydrogen and helium we call a metal in astronomy. 
Um, those were all formed in stars. They were formed as generations of stars, took in material, nuclear fusion in the core, belched that material back out. The stars we see today in the universe are formed very differently to the stars in the early universe. So we want to see them. We want to go and find them. What does first light in our universe look like? So how do you do that? <clears throat> well, you've got to look at red, high redshift. You've got to look further and further back in the universe. And I showed you the Hubble images of um, its ultra-deep fields. And you can see here that's marked as redshift zero. So the local universe, if that's a black body curve of a typical star and therefore a galaxy, an ensemble of stars, it peaks in the visible. It's quite easy to see in the visible. But if you move out <coughs> to higher redshift, so larger distances further back in time, redshift three is already going quite far back. It's around 11 and a half billion years into the past. So you're seeing quite early into the evolution of the universe at that point. But you can see because of redshift, this issue of the expansion of the universe dragging the light out in, in, uh, as, as space-time expands, that light is now shifted to peak in the infrared. And then if you go to redshift of 10, which is 13.1 billion years in the past, so now you're within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang, all of that light is now shifted into the infrared. And this is exactly where we want to go and look for those first galaxies. A few hundred million years after the Big Bang, all of that light is in the infrared. But it's actually worse than that. Not only are those galaxies redshifted, but of course, because they're so far away from us, they're very faint. And what we call cosmological dimming does this. It makes them incredibly faint. That's a logarithmic scale on the left-hand side, so that um, the, the flux ratio there is on the order of 10 to the 10, 10 orders of magnitude fainter by being at very high redshift. So you need to be observing in the infrared to see these galaxies, these very early galaxies, and you need a big telescope to collect lots of photons. Because you need to observe in the infrared, you have a bit of a problem. The optical comes through the Earth's atmosphere pretty well. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere is quite transparent at those wavelengths. Um, but shortward of that, in the ultraviolet and the hard UV and then X-ray and gamma ray, the atmosphere is completely opaque. You can't see anything, so you need to go to space to look at those wavelengths. And then you look at longer wavelengths, the near and mid-infrared is all chopped up by these water absorption bands, as I mentioned before, so that gets very messy in there. You can't always see at all wavelengths. And then you get out to 100 microns or one millimeter, it's opaque. Um, and then there's a big open area for radio astronomy at, at a few centimeters up to a meter. The atmosphere is transparent there. And then at super long wavelengths, you can't see either. So we have built many missions to go into space to get to different wavelengths. The high energy missions on the left-hand side, Planck and Herschel there in the far infrared and, and, and millimeter. You can get above some of the atmosphere, as I said before, by building telescopes at high altitude. Uh, or by putting telescopes on airplanes. Um, but if you want to look in the near and mid-infrared, the very best place to be is in space. Now, so I've talked about two of the reasons we want to go. Galaxies, high redshift, infrared, very faint. You need a big telescope in space. But it also brings advantages at other wavelengths. So one of the things, this is a, a classical image, um, which you will have seen, I'm sure, many times, what's called the Pillars of Creation. This is actually a more recent version. The original came out in 1995, uh, taken by Hubble shortly after it was repaired. And it's a, it's a fascinating image, although many people look at it uh, in the general public and they say they've been told that there are stars being born in these giant pillars of gas and dust. One of the weird things is you can't see them. Um, you have to be told that they're there. You can't see the stars that are forming. Um, you infer their presence in these optical images. And the reason is that all of the dust which you see here obscuring the light is the stars which are forming in these pillars are embedded in that dust. And that dust is very effective at absorbing optical light. Optical photons can't escape through dust very well. But if you go into the near infrared, exactly the same region, the dust becomes transparent and you see that. <clears throat> Not only do you now see the young stars forming at the tops of these pillars, for example, and on some of these lumps and bumps further down. But you also see the great swathe of the Milky Way behind the dust which is in this region. So by going into the infrared, you get the added ability to look in star-forming regions, places where young stars and planets are being born today. 
Now, the other reason to go into the near-infrared, of course, and I mentioned this when I showed, talked about the telescope glowing, uh, because humans glow, because everything glows at around 300 Kelvin, is if you want to look at low temperature objects in the universe, you also need to go to the infrared, because they're not going to give out any light in the visible. Um, there's a 3,000 Kelvin object, which is giving out most of its light in the object, uh, in, in the visible. If I go to 300, 30 Kelvin, and all the way down to the CMB at 3 Kelvin, the black body curve moves to longer wavelengths. So if you want to look at cool objects, you need to be observing infrared wavelengths. And by cool objects, I mean things like young stars and young planets which are forming. Uh, then they haven't reached the uh, nuclear fusion stage. They're much cooler than they will be later on in their evolution. So these are all the reasons to observe in the infrared. And one of the classical places to see this combination of dust and temperature uh, come together for star formation <coughs> is this. This is the, uh, the Orion Nebula seen in the visible with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's kind of rotated 90 degrees to put it on the screen a bit more eff effectively. You can see in the middle the so-called trapezium stars, which are very massive stars giving out lots of ultraviolet photons, illuminating all of the nebula you see here. But this is a star-forming region. It's not only, it doesn't only have the trapezium cluster in the middle, it has thousands of other young stars which are only visible when you strip away the dust and you go to lower effective observing temperatures by going to the infrared. The same region of the infrared looks like this from the ground. <clears throat> now, not only do you see the thousands of young stars, about a million years old, sitting in the middle here, and we're seeing objects as massive as the sun, a tenth of a solar mass, all the way down to objects as small as a few times the mass of Jupiter we can see from the ground in this region. And then when we look off to the left-hand side, we see lots of embedded stuff that isn't visible at all in the, in the Hubble optical image. And these are young stars at around 100,000 years old being born in a giant molecular cloud. And this actually is one of the first things I'll be looking at with James Webb Space Telescope in September this year, because as a member of the science working group, we have guaranteed observing time in return for our work on the project over these decades. And that's where I said, that's what I want to observe with JWST. And the reason to do it is actually to get to much higher spatial resolution, get more detailed images, but because we won't have that shaking of the Earth's atmosphere, the turbulence, the seeing. But also I want to get to the very lowest mass objects. Are there objects as low as one Jupiter or even the mass of Saturn floating freely in a region like this? How far down the range of masses does star formation actually work? So that's something I'll be doing um, in a few months' time. I'm also going to be looking in there for these things. These at the top are pictures taken by Hubble, um, which I did uh, a long time ago, nearly 30 years ago now with Hubble, taking images um, in visible light where you see smudges of dark, um, uh, effectively it's a silhouette against the background nebula. And those silhouettes are protoplanetary disks, places where young planets are being born around stars today, seen as shadows against the background nebula. And in more recent years, by using um, millimeter interferometers like ALMA, we can resolve the structure, the thermal emission of those kinds of disks very effectively. We can see gaps, we can see rings, we can see the dynamic effects of planets being born in those disks. And so we'll be going back and revisiting these at high resolution in the infrared with JWST. So these are some of the broad science goals. The birth and evolution of stars and their planetary systems. You can also go in, of course, not just take images and do spectroscopy. There's lots of very interesting chemistry going on in the disks of um, uh, young stars where the planets are being born at their early phases. They're very dense, there's lots of gas and dust, and there's all sorts of nice traces in the infrared, ammonia, hydrogen cyanide, carbon dioxide, which will let us understand the temperature range and the, the composition on the disk as a function of radius. How are planets being put together? What are they being made out of? And we can extend that science from the young planets being born to exoplanets by looking at planets which transit in front of their parent stars, obviously not in an image like this, but just looking at a point of light and seeing how the star gets slightly fainter at, at dip, and differently at different wavelengths as the planet moves in front of the star, we can infer the properties of its atmosphere. And it, even though JWST was never designed to, to do exoplanet science, it has such a versatile set of instrumentation 
that it's roughly a third of the observing time will be used for looking at exoplanets. We can also study our own planetary system, our own solar system. At least we can look, um, as you'll see in a little while, we're sitting out here, um, JWST is a million and a half kilometers from the Earth. We can't look this way, we can't look inwards towards Venus or Mercury or the Sun, but we will be able to look at all objects outwards. And I'll explain why that is. Why can't we look inwards? Why can we only look outwards? But I'll explain that in a second. So, this is the classical design of the Hubble Space Telescope. It has a mirror 2.4 meters in diameter at the end of a tube. The light is reflected back to a secondary mirror at the front of the tube, and then the light goes back to instruments at the back end. As I said before, it was launched in uh, April 1990, has been serviced a bunch of times, um, so it's still working, uh, it's still active today, but some of its systems are becoming a bit cranky. We had some outages last year, which had to be recovered from, but it's still working. And as I said, it's in low Earth orbit at 500 kilometers. And what that means for that telescope is because the Earth is very close by, it's just beneath it, the Earth is warming the telescope. The telescope is not very cold at all. The telescope's roughly at room temperature. Uh, and in fact, the primary mirror is actively cooled to be at room temperature. So it's glowing like crazy in the infrared. It is not a good infrared telescope, Hubble, but it was never designed to be. Um, just one point there to note is it's 12 and a half tons. It was launched in a shuttle. Uh, it's quite a big, hefty telescope. But by comparison, this is the thing we've now built. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and by comparison, a much bigger primary mirror uh, with 18 segments made out of lightweighted beryllium. The total span is six and a half meters rather than 2.4 meters. Uh, so we have 25 times the collecting area that, uh, that Hubble does. Uh, it's a much lighter telescope, on the other hand, only six tons. Uh, and that had to, be, it had to be engineered to be much lighter so that we could launch it much further away from Earth. And I'll explain towards the end that we're out in this orbit called uh, a point called L2, a million and a half kilometers away. And so we needed a much lighter telescope to get out there. And I'm going to explain in detail um, some of these odd features you see, this giant sun shield, why we have the, the, the way the 18 mirrors work together, how they're aligned and why we have the sun shield to separate the cold side of the telescope at the top and the hot side of the telescope below. So I've been giving this kind of talk for a very long time, but I'm certainly extremely happy that I've been able to finally put an actual launch date on there um, of Christmas Day. And I'm also very happy to say I was there, and you'll see in a moment, uh, just five kilometers away from the launch on Christmas Day. Uh, my family were very understanding. We celebrated Christmas on the 28th of December this year. Um, but at least I could FaceTime them from the launch and show them what was going on. That was fun. Just to go into some of the details a little bit more, because um, we have a bit of time this morning. So here's that big primary mirror with its 18 individual segments. Each one of those segments has been polished to be the right shape for where it is in the mirror. They're not interchangeable. They're all, they're, they're a unique set of mirrors which are in the right places, but they're all adjustable. They can all be moved, tip tilted, rotated, pistoned, and you can even pull on the back of them to change their center of curvature slightly. So this is very important to the way we actually make that mirror into one giant mirror, contiguous mirror. And as you'll see in a moment, the light is reflected uh, from the primary onto the secondary and then back through to the backside where the scientific instruments are here. And again, all on the cold side of the telescope at just 40 Kelvin on this side, while this side faces the sun and is at temperatures at roughly 300 to 400 Kelvin on this side. So we have four science instruments and I'll talk about those uh, in a little while. And of course we have to send data back to Earth. So we have a high gain antenna here. We have solar panel for generating power. We actually, pe some people who are astute say, what's that thing sticking up there? That's an emergency S-band an antenna. If the telescope actually ever fell out of its orientation, we want to have the ability to communicate with it. So we have uh, these S-band antennas on board as well. Hopefully we never use that one, but uh, that's where it is. So let's walk you through it. So here's simply the light, this is very trivial, the light comes in from space, is reflected off the primary, off the secondary, and then through, but it doesn't quite go straight to the mirror, uh, to the instruments behind. What it's doing here, and I'll show you in this next picture, the light is coming from the secondary mirror, being reflected from a tertiary, and then off what we call the fine steering mirror. So this mirror is actually moving at around one hertz, once a second, so that we can steer the telescope to lock onto targets very finely. By looking at stars in the instrument, in the payload bay at the back here, 
and watch how they slightly move, we can lock them and guide them to get extremely high accuracy. And the reason for that is that JWST is big and floppy and not a stiff telescope like Hubble. Uh, and there are thermal mismatches across one side of the telescope to the other, which make it effectively slightly deform as we move the telescope to new targets. But by having this fine steering mirror, we can lock and get the ultimate precision in our imaging. So that's completely different to the way that Hubble works. Hubble just points and, and it guides, but doesn't use this rapid fine steering mirror, which we do. And then when you get to the focal plane, the light falls on four instruments and all of them can operate uh, simultaneously. There's no flip mirror to go from one to the other. So we have um, a camera system, near-infrared camera system called NearCam. There are two separate modules um, and they can cover both the short wavelengths in the near-infrared and the long wavelengths. But as I said before, we're not only interested in taking images of deep space, we want to understand the physical characteristics, the chemical characteristics. And so for that, we do spectroscopy <clears throat> with the European NearSpec instrument, which allows us to select objects, individual galaxies or stars or planets maybe even, and select them and then put their light through um, a spectrograph and spread that out like a, like a rainbow and analyze the characteristics. We have another Canadian camera um, here, which also can do spectroscopy called NIRIS. That's in the near infrared. And then we have the European uh, US MIRI mid-infrared instrument, which does both imaging and spectroscopy in a very complicated way, as you'll see in a second, um, uh, from five microns all the way to the longest wavelengths that JWS can see around 30 microns. So as I said, all of these can operate simultaneously and we have the fine guidance sensors, which I talked about before. That's where the light falls, we register stars, and we monitor their positions, and we then steer that little mirror in the front. Well, little, it's about this big, but uh, uh, to keep things in the right position. <clears throat> so let's have a quick look at just how, for example, how MIRI does imaging. The light comes in from the telescope. How does MIRI do that? Well, this is the MIRI instrument. Um, you'll see the light coming in from the left-hand side off a pick-off mirror. Uh, coming through down through a turret. It goes through um, all metal mirror re reflections through a filter wheel, uh, then is re-imaged onto the detector at the end. And by rotating the filter wheel, you can select different pieces of the wavelength range. So that's fairly straightforward. Light comes down off the four optics, through, this is a collimator, through the filter wheel, off the camera, onto the detector. Fairly straightforward. Now, for spectroscopy things get a bit more complicated so this is near spec uh, the near infrared spectrograph um, light also comes in on the pickoff mirror at this point on the bottom side as you'll see here this entire instrument for, is, is a um, very um, high-tech European technology it's all made of silicon carbide which is very stiff and very lightweight um, now we see the four optics send the light through this box which I'm going to talk about in a moment then through the collimator through off the gratings off the camera onto the detector. So already a lot more complicated. These four optics basically get the light prepared to go through this what we call micro shutter array which I'm going to show you. And that's where we can select individual objects in the field of view by opening little doors and saying this galaxy will get a spectrum of that one. All the other doors around it will be closed so we don't get the background coming through from them as well. And then we have these gratings and prisms which then split the light up to actually make the spectra before they're imaged onto the detector there. So this micro shutter array is a very ingenious little machine. Um, we have four of them here with 65,000 little slits in each one. So we have roughly a quarter of a million slits where we can, through uh, a, a mixture of electrostatics and magnets, we can actually select which doors we want to open in this array and let the light in in that location. Then we get a spectrum of that object. Uh, and that allows us to do up to uh, 100 of objects at once. Obviously, you can't have two slits next to each other as the spectra will overlap. So there's all sorts of algorithms to select which objects are visible. Um, but we'll use the images to select the objects which are interesting for follow-up and then use NearSpec to do that spectroscopy. Now, there's another way of doing spectroscopy. Um, this is rather classical as you end up with lots of these um, spectra which look like this. This is ground-based calibration data. But the other way you can do spectroscopy is by what we call imaging spectroscopy. You can take a piece of the field of view of the sky and you split it with optics so that each row is then redirected into the instrument in different places and that each row then gets split in the other direction into a long spectrum. So you can, by 
Splitting the light up cleverly with mirrors, you can get a spectrum for every pixel in your original image. And I, I enjoy showing this because whoever thought of this was either had a very good weekend or being on the session, as I just heard, because it, it was designed in Scotland, so it's very important to realize that um, uh, appropriate amounts of um, substances were involved in the design of this. <laughs> Wherever you are, Martin Wells, I, I salute you for having come up with this. So in this case, this is the mirror instrument again. You'll see the light coming in just for the sake of it coming in from the other side this time. And it's all going to go into the bottom end of this, this point. The imager is in the top side, so we're going to go straight down through the deck into the bottom half. The light's going to get split into different wavelength ranges here. It then gets split off, all the, off the slitlets, off all the mirrors, off the lenses, uh, no lenses, off the gratings, and then imaged onto the cameras. And that all happens simultaneously. All the wavelengths can be split up from 5 to 30 microns. So... If you're budding instrumental uh, um, astronomers, you have to come up with something like this. That's your generation's challenge. We managed to build this thing, and it works. Uh, you have to come up with something cleverer than that. And this, this is a box around a meter cubed, and that's all happening uh, with highly, uh, high, high precision machined optics in there. So those are the instruments, the four instruments. Let's go back to the telescope and see how that was built up. As I said, we have these 18 hexagonal segments, which um, were individually... Um, Poli uh, manufactured out of beryllium, polished down to the right shape, tested at cryogenic temperatures at 40 Kelvin, and then brought back out, repolished to get them into exactly the right temperature. Because remember, they're, they're made at room temperature but have to operate at 40 Kelvin, um, and the shape might distort. Beryllium is a very good material for that. It doesn't distort across that temperature range, but they were all cryopolished, so that's uh, an important part. They were all brought together at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, um, and placed individually onto the backing structure made out of carbon fiber, which you can see here. You can also see the carbon fiber structure that holds a secondary mirror, which reflects the light back down into the tertiary optics. And here are those four instruments in their actual shape, not the, as, as computer graphics. So that's um, uh, MIRI there in the top corner, which I showed you. Uh, the, the complicated optics here is near spec, which is almost two meters in size with all of its complicated optics. Um, the nearest FGS, fine guidance sensor, and then the, the crucial camera system here. The camera system is critical not only for taking pictures with the telescope, because it's also how we align the optics. Um, without the camera system and the special optics it has in it, we couldn't even align the mirror to begin with. And actually, that's why it has two separate camera systems for redundancy. It could, if one side fails completely, we still have a camera uh, to align the telescope. Um, this is just to show you, this is near spec, um, all packaged up in a lot of covers. Near spec as a spectrometer is incredibly sensitive to scattered light, um, and so that had to be made incredibly light tight and installed on the side with the other instruments. Now, none of this is serviceable. None of this can be taken out and new things put in. So um, it's very densely packed and wired. It's a completely different thing to Hubble. We will not service the James Webb Space Telescope because it's far too far away from Earth, as you'll see. The this instrument module was tested cryogenically um, at Goddard Space Flight Center and then installed on the back of the telescope. So you can see the, <coughs> the big um, radiator here, which I'll talk about in a moment, with the instruments attached being installed on the back of the telescope. Then everything was packaged up in a big airplane, uh, C5, and flown off to Houston, where the whole telescope was then brought together in this giant cryogenic chamber. This is a liquid helium chamber. It was originally built and used to um, test the Apollo modules in the 1960s. So this has a long heritage, Chamber A at the Johnson Space Center, and now has another very major um, uh, blue tick, if you like, for having done all the testing. The cryo testing took about six months of JWST being inside that cryo chamber, making sure all the optics were working the light was feeding through to the instruments properly. And then we had to put on this thing, the sun shield. So the sun shield is used to block the light coming from the sun and from the earth, reaching the telescope, and that has to reduce the flux on one side of this tennis court size structure. The flux on one side is around 300 kilowatts of solar flux, and on the other side, it's about 10 mi uh, milliwatts. So you've got to reduce the flux by enormous amounts to get uh, the telescope cold on the other side, down to 40 Kelvin. And these five layers of material, it's about 100 microns thick, about the thickness of human hair, 
um, of aluminized or aluminiumized, I'm not sure if there's an American, a British version of aluminized, uh, metalized uh, plastic film, capped on film, um, has to be uh, pulled out into the shape that you see here uh, and tensioned and these five individual layers all have to be separated so that there's no thermal conduction between them. And then it all has to be packaged up and wrapped um, very precisely in layers with pins holding each layer down. And I used to say this was by far the most worrying part of JWST because all of this stuff had to deploy in space when we got there. Hundreds of little pins had to open and let the layers come out as we unfolded the telescope. But you know what? I don't care anymore because it worked. Uh, and it worked amazingly well. This was by far the, the, the hardest part in James Webb Space Telescope because it's big and floppy and it's, it's essentially analog. It's not a motor. Move from A to B, click, lock. It's just a sail that all had to be pulled out with cables and wires. So crazy piece of technology, but it worked. So this is the whole machine put together in the state, the best state we could ever see it from the ground. Even here, the primary mirror wings are folded back and the secondary mirror structure is folded up um, because they're not strong enough to hold themselves against gravity. It wasn't designed that way. But you can get a sense of scale from the people here on the cherry pickers looking on. This is a huge machine, again, the size of a tennis court, uh, but very tall as well, as you can see. And that whole thing was then folded up and packaged and sent to French Guiana. This is one of ESA's contributions to the project. Um, there it is, that picture I showed you at the beginning, in the clean room in November. At the same time when we were there, the Ariane 5 rocket had just arrived. And this, from, and historically, from a political perspective, it was always seen as a bit of a risk that um, the Americans were willing to launch um, their most precious astronomical os uh, asset on a French rocket. Lots of Americans unhappy about this for quite a long time. Uh, and in fact, at the time when we selected and we proposed to use the Ariane 5, Ariane 5 had only had three successful launches. It's now had 110. Um, so it was an incredibly wise uh, move in retrospect. And in fact, what happened on the day, and if I don't say it later, I'll say it now, um, the Ariane 5 performed so perfectly, it put JWST on such a perfect trajectory. Of course, you model these things with Monte Carlo uh, simulations. You say, what are the chances of this motor being slightly off relative to that motor? Is this all going to work? How much fuel do we need to carry on board the observatory itself to adjust the trajectory after we've been let go by the rocket? It was so perfect, we saved enough fuel on the observatory itself to probably double the lifetime to go from 10 years of fuel on the observatory itself to maybe 20 years. Lots of very happy Americans now about having chosen a French rocket. Um, so that, this is the, the rocket on rollout um, in, in what we call the, the BAF, uh, the Batiment Assemblage Final in, 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 um, there in Kourou. Um, and I was, as I say, I was down there. That was on the, about the 24th, 23rd of December. And I'm just going to show you the launch now. I'm going to show you a little clip from the actual moment as seen from the, the Toucan site. So five kilometers away, um, the control center is 12 kilometers away. And I had been told that's where I needed to be in case the director general needed some help talking about the science. I said, not doing that. I'm going to Toucan uh, because being five kilometers away is a lot better than being 12 kilometers away from a rocket launch. On the other hand, you probably don't want to be that much closer than five kilometers. So five kilometers is fine. It's fine. It's loud, it's bright, it's big, uh, it's a good place to be. But you'll get a little bit of a sense from this um, nice piece of documentary made by a French filmmaker, uh, the emotion that this brings. Six, seven, get, one, two, from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself, James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. Rocket continues. 
continues uh, to fly uphill in nominal fashion. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> this is the bit where I fail to give the rest of the talk. Um, no, look, so I, you, I, if you spotted me there, I was, I was in the picture there. Um, at, at some point there, but yeah, it was quite something. Um, and the people who had worked on this project, of course, for many, many years, um, you could sense these are, these are from the US team, you were Europeans there, there were Canadians there, it was really a very special, special moment. And of course that continued because of course we separated from the, uh, the rocket and we had cameras on stall on the Ariane 5 for the first time to see the, the upper stage uh, deployment of JWST. I'm gonna show you the speeded up version there's a, the full um, uh, real-time version is available on the web. You can um, go and have a look for that. But just to show you what happened, we had the cameras and we were lucky enough to catch the deployment of the solar array, which was critical uh, because without solar array, we have no power, we have no observatory. So this is the JWST looking from the top of the stack, looking towards the mirrors at the top end here, and you'll see it depart. You'll also see the boosters um, on the rocket, which we're going to stay on where the cameras are, the upper stage, they fire and you'll see that reflected in the base of the telescope. We're over the Gulf of Aden at this point, if you want to know, so that's... Uh... So the telescope's flowing freely, no propulsion at all at this point, but you see now the deployment of the solar panel come here. Um, there were probably just as many cheers there as there were at the launch of the actual rocket itself. You get the J.J. Abrams glinting of the light off the, you know, it was perfect. Um, then we get stuff floating around. But as I say, you can go and see the whole thing uh, on the web. So let's see what we had to do next. And you will have seen this, and I, and I show this because this was all incredibly difficult to make work, but it did. Uh, there's a little bit of music here to uh, take us through. So this will show you what had to happen in the first two weeks, all the things that had to go right. And it was a lot slower than the launch. So hence the music being kind of different. So we had to deploy the big solar array first. That happened 20 minutes in. Communicate with Earth with a high gain antenna. <laughs> and then over the, the, the first um, weeks, deploy the sun shield uh, to get the telescope to start to cool down. So put the pallets down and then move the telescope up so it's not thermally connected anymore uh, to the rest of the telescope. Thermally decoupled with just a very low conductivity beam. Then that thing at the back, somebody wants to ask me what that was at the back. I, it's too long to talk about, but it's a great question. And then we deploy, we deploy the sun shield uh, coming out here very slowly, layer by layer, these five layers, all through cables and pulleys and motors, very slowly done. And this is where everybody who knew anything about the project was nervous because this stuff was, had never been tested in low gravity before. And we separate the five out so they're not touching each other. Now you see the main, the secondary mirror folding over. The radiator comes up the back here. This is needed to cool the instruments down. Um, and then finally the two primary wings. Now this was all happening, it was we're on our way to L2. So this L2 point, one and a half million kilometers away from Earth, um, sits at a point that's gravitationally stable and follows the Earth around the Sun. And effectively what that means is you can keep the Sun and the Earth always on one side of the observatory. Um, but close enough, staying close to the Earth, you can always beam back lots of data. So we beam back you know, 20 gigabytes of data a day back from JWST. So you want to be relatively close, a million and a half kilometers relatively close, but you always want the sun and the earth on one side so that the other side sees the darkness of space and can cool down. And so in reality, that orbit looks like this. It's a rather complicated orbit around the L2 point, and we have to use station keeping to keep in that place. Although it's a stable point in space, in one direction, it's unstable in the other. So we do need to use a little bit of repellent. And that's a life limiter on the observatory. That's what will... Um, it, in the end, mean the end of the mission. But because we save fuel from the launch, we think we have 20 years of lifetime now rather than 10. So that's a, a very effective uh, use of a rocket there. Now, which piece of the sky can we see at any given time? Because the sun, if you're the sun over there and I'm looking out in the darkness of space, I'm not actually looking directly away from the sun, I'm looking sideways. So you would think I can only see up 
Well, I can rotate the whole observatory around the axis pointing towards the sun, okay, around the sun line here. And that means I can sweep out a swathe, an, a, an annulus at any given point during the year. But as I go around the sun, I sweep out a different annulus. As I go around the sun, I sweep out a different annulus. So during the year, I can cover all parts of the sky. I just can't do them all on a given day. So there will be some targets which might, targets of opportunity, a supernova. If it goes in the wrong part of the sky at the wrong time, we won't be able to see it. But we can see roughly 50% of the sky at any given time because of the way that geometry of the swathe works. We can also tilt the telescope backwards and forwards a bit by 50 degrees. So we sweep out this 50 degree wide field of view. Um, so we can see a fair amount of the sky, but in the year, we, at any given time, in the year we can see all of it. Now, where are we today? You've been following this online, no doubt. One of the first things that was done was to <coughs> put starlight through the telescope. You see they have 18 individual telescopes because the, the mirror segments are not all pointing in the same direction. But by taking images, then moving them slightly, we could identify which was which. Uh, we could also look back through some optics and actually essentially take a selfie of the, of the primary mirror. Uh, but in the last week or so, we've managed to pull all of the 18 segments together, uh, know exactly which one is which, put them in this hexagonal array, uh, and then move the mirrors, uh, piston them to bring them closer into focus and change their orientations uh, according to models and make a much more um, precise image for each of those stars. So you see the before and the after. So we're moving towards the full focusing of the telescope in this array, and then we can drag the images all together and form one star. So we've already got to the point where we can make one star. But, but, your uh, physics and astronomy students, most of you I'm sure, um, at this point, those 18 mirrors are not in phase. Those 18 mirrors are collecting the light individually and we're able to stack them to form one image. But until we've adjusted the, the, um, the distance between the mirrors to just a few nanometers, they're not in phase. We're not getting the full interference uh, effect that we need to give us the highest angular resolution. So when we phase the mirrors, which is what's going on now, this star, this, the, the size of this uh, point spread function will shrink by a factor of five it will get five times sharper. So we'll get much sharper images than you're seeing already. But everything is going extremely well at this point. Um, there have been hiccups and things wrong with bits of software and bits of hardware have not talked to the software properly, all being fixed. Everything's going very well. And we have a six month period now. We're about two months into it, uh, a bit more than that now. So by this summer, we should have all of the telescope phased up. We should have all the instruments checked out and operating we should be able to start doing the science that we've been waiting for very long. So just to remind you of what that science is, we're gonna be looking at places where there are stars and planets uh, being born in our own Milky Way today, looking at the evolution of planetary systems. We're gonna be looking at the atmospheres of exoplanets that we know. We're not gonna be discovering new exoplanets with JWST, that's other missions, but we can follow them up with great precision and look at the, uh, the atmospheres of exoplanets. We can look at larger scale star formation in our own Milky Way. We can also look at obviously larger scale structures, galaxies, looking at how they merge and how they change, how galaxies evolve over cosmic time. But as we look further and further away, we'll be able to look at what we call the cosmic web. It's a, not a coincidence, maybe. Um, the way that galaxies are formed out of filaments of dark matter and baryonic matter streaming together over cosmic time well, we get back to this kind of image, this ultra deep field image, where we sweep across huge swathes of the sky. This is in the visible, um, but with the infrared telescope, the JWST, we should be able to probe beyond the faintest, most distant galaxies that you see there and find for the first time those first light galaxies, those ones that formed just 100 to 200 million years after the Big Bang. And so that's the dream. That's the dream we all had back uh, before almost all of you in the room were even born. I hate to say that's terrible, but uh, it goes back that far. Um, and there, just to show that you can stay involved for a long time, if you want to get involved in space telescope projects, uh, this is what you have to do. Um, you have to have some dedication or stupidity or both, one or the other. Uh, this has been one of the longest duration space projects uh, ever, but um, I got involved in 1998. So that's me just there at ESTEC, European Space Agency. I wasn't working for ESA at that point. Uh, I was in, working in Germany then, um, came to the UK, was a professor in, in, in Exeter for a few years, joined ESA in 2009. Um, 
I didn't have much hair in 1998, but at least, you know, I'm a bit grayer now. But I can have to say, you know, it's just such a pleasure to be able to come and talk to you because this is your telescope. You know, we built this because we had ideas back in the 90s about what we wanted to do. And almost all of the ideas we had, they haven't been done because they couldn't be done without this machine. A cold, big infrared telescope in space, it needed this machine to be done. But it's yours because it's open to everybody. Anybody can apply to use it, whether it, you're at ESA, NASA, Canadian Space Agency, wherever you are in the world, it's open to the world, and you're the people that will make by far the best use of that. Um, so uh, with that, I just wanted to just give a quick plug for something. If you're bored and you're, you know, uh, you've had enough space, but you want to talk to, uh, hear about space, but hear about it with talking to musicians and astronauts and uh, actors and interesting <laughs> scientists and engineers, I run a thing called Space Rocks. Um, we do big live public events, or at least we did until uh, two, uh, end of uh, uh, 2019. But we've been doing this now for two years. Uh, we are kind of a fortnightly thing called Uplink where we talk to interesting people. If you've got sci-fi eyes, you'll see Jason Isaacs from Harry Potter, from uh, Star Trek. Got some astronauts in there. We recently spoke to the two authors of The Expanse, the producers, the, uh, so lots there going on. Have a look for it. Uh, online. With that, thank you very much for your time. Go and make good use of this telescope. It's yours. Thank you so much, Mark, for that fantastic talk. I think we have time for a few questions. Do you have anyone? Just go over here first. Uh, hello. That, that thing on the telescope that you said you wouldn't explain, what does it do? I'm, I'm acoustically challenged. Um, the uh, component at the back of the telescope that you said you wouldn't go into details about, what roughly does it do? Uh, ten points for Gryffindor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, no, it, 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 because people say, what's that for? What's that flat? What's that for? It's, a li it's, it's not complicated, but it's a subtle thing. It just goes to what we call systems engineering. When you design a machine like this, there's so many details you have to think about. So the telescope has this big sun shield, and that obviously is to keep the telescope cold, but the light hitting that sun shield also has pressure, a radiation pressure, and it pushes on the telescope. Now, you would say it's going to push it away from the sun. Yeah, a little bit, but we can keep it close to the sun with the propulsion systems. Actually, we keep it by not going uphill at L2, but that's, that's another thing. But the other thing it does is it will, if you think about where the, that sun shield is going to have a center of light, okay, a point about which the light pressure works, the effective center. And it, also the telescope has a center of mass. Okay? And if the center of light and the center of mass are not on the same line as the direction to the sun, there's going to be a torque. And that's going to rotate the telescope. And the telescope's going to start tumbling from radiation pressure. And you've got to stop that. And you can stop that by internally turning reaction wheels, momentum wheels. You turn those wheels. And as the telescope wants to rotate, you turn the wheels the other way. And that absorbs the angular momentum. Now, at some point, the wheels spin up and up and up and up. They spin too fast, right? So you've got to slow them down again. So the way we get rid of the angular momentum in the wheels is by using propulsion. We actually fire rockets or little thrusters in the other direction, and that then offloads the wheels. And that, that means we run out of fuel for that in the end. So that's another life limiter on the observatory. So how to preserve the fuel? Well, the best way is to put this thing out at the back called a trim tab. The aft flap actually acts by calculation to say, let's put that out at just the right angle so that it will put the center of light and the center of mass along the same line, as, f as precisely as we can calculate. It's not adjustable. So this was done on the ground and calculated by analysis. And we're currently right in the middle of measuring how effective that is. We know it's close. We know it's good. But you know, the closer that is to perfect, the less fuel we'll have to use um, for this momentum offload which is why I didn't talk about it in the talk, because it's a three-minute answer to the question. But thank you for asking it. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Uh, so thank you for all the Twitter threads that we've been following for months. And tell us about they, they are. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I just wanted to ask about serviceability. You, obviously, it doesn't have the ability to be replaced like Hubble, um, but one of the life-limiting factors is fuel. Is there a possibility of doing like a mission extension vehicle or something that can 
keep the fuel for longer to extend the mission rather than replace any of the optics or elements? Yeah, I mean, before the launch, we, we knew we had a five-year goal, a uh, five-year requirement rather, and a, fi and a ten-year goal. And there was a lot of discussion, even at Kuru around the time, and I was sitting down with Thomas Abuchan, who's the NASA administrator, and he was saying, oh, we're planning already to refuel. This is before the launch. We launched and then found uh, that the Ariane 5 had done so well that it had extended the lifetime for 20 years. And almost all of that talk went away, because we know there are other things on the observatory, electronics, cosmic rays, uh, damage to gyroscopes. You know, there are life-limited items on board, not by design, but you just know from experience using these. So the idea of trying to fly there to extend 20 years to, say, 30 years is an awful lot less interesting than it was when it was five, maybe five years to 10 years or 10 to 20. So I, I wouldn't say that talk's gone away, but if, if anything, it's pushed it further into the future. We don't have to have that discussion today. The only thing which we've done on board is put markers around the hydrazine tanks so that if a robotic refueling device came along, it would actually know where the hydrazine tank was be able to couple to it, but it would have to drill a hole in the, in the lid and then refuel it and uh, let's just build another telescope. I mean, you know, and, and I, I don't, that's a kind of flippant answer, but we are already, of course, beginning to design the next machine. We started designing this before Hubble was even launched. We now know what we think the next one will look like, uh, maybe a six and a half to eight meter telescope that works in the visible or the ultraviolet, so much more accurate mirrors uh, and that would be for imaging exoplanets, for example. So with a 20-year lifetime, it's just a, a less interesting question, I think. But uh, it was never designed with it in mind either uh, because of the L2 location. Hi, Mark. I just wanted to ask, do you know what the first image that will be released? <laughs> will it be the pillars of creation so people can see the difference? And also, I was going to say, excellent answer regarding the R but the OU Space Society did hold an event last week which explained that in much more depth. So if you do want to know, check out our YouTube channel. <laughs> so, um, the way that JWST Observing is structured is that it's open to everybody, and, and that's what we call general observers. You wrote a proposal, and if you're lucky, well, no, you have to be good, not just lucky. Good and lucky, you'll get observing time. Um, there are other categories of observers. So the early release science observations, which were programs selected a couple of years ago, which will test out all of the instruments and put data fully into the public domain on the first day that they're taken so that you can go and look at them and say, oh, I know, ooh, this is tricky, this part. I'd better design my observing proposal a different way. And then there's the guaranteed time observers like me who've had time for 20 years and we've got our programs locked in. But the, the other category is things are early release observations. These are the images which, and the spectra, presumably, that will be taken and put out for PR purposes to, to announce that JWST is working. I have no idea what they are. Um, and you will not know. Uh, it, the, the, the sense of omerta about this is intense. Uh, the idea of keeping them quiet and making a big splash. I mean, I'm on the science team. I have no idea what they are. I know what they aren't. And they aren't the objects I'm looking at. They're not the objects anybody else is looking at because we're not preempting people's own observing time. So unless they're going to cheat me, it will not be the Orion Nebula. It can't be the Orion Nebula because we can't see it in June anyway. It's only a September or March object uh, from JWST. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'll be just like all the rest of you. I'll see them on the day uh, because they don't trust me. I'm a blabbermouth. If I, if I did know, I would have told you. <laughs> I'm afraid that's uh, all the time we're going to have for questions, um, but I'm sure you can all catch up with Mark uh, after the talk. We're now going to go to a 10-minute break, 10 minutes or so, and be back here at 5.2 for our next talks. Uh, please enjoy uh, getting a break and make sure to check out our interactive area across the way uh, where you can Thank play you. with our interactive area. <laughs>
uh, where we aim to further build the nexus between arts and STEM. And to do so, we have uh, Rita Hollingham, our chair, uh, which is going to be used the rest of the panel right now. So as always, if you have any questions, pop them in there, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this, this panel. Um, I want to address the lie, really, that there sh is or should be a, a divide between science and the arts. And, and that's what the A in STEAM is, arts, in its broadest sense. And I think as you're here this afternoon, the future of space exploration needs creative people. And um, we've got an awesome panel of creative people people here. Um, just a quick uh, Q&A for the audience from my perspective. Uh, so who here, can you put your hands up if you are a scientist or an engineer? Yeah, it's pretty much everyone. That's sort of what I was expecting. That's our control group, if you like. Okay, so who here is also an artist or dabbles in art or likes to do art in some form? Yeah, there's a few. Uh, who here is a, a musician or plays an instrument or wishes they played an instrument? And can the artists keep their hands up as well? So those previous people. Yeah, excellent. Any writers here? Keep your hands up. <laughs> so let's just have hands up for... I know it's, it's, uh, it's, it was probably a tough night last night. Let's have um, uh, hands up for any artists, musicians, writers, anyone who does anything vaguely creative. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much everyone. There's one person here who doesn't, who claims they don't do anything creative, but I think that, don't think that's entirely true. Um, just before I introduce the panel, uh, let me just give you a sense of my perspective on this. I'm a, a science journalist, so my job, uh, my, my original degree is in applied biology. My job is to interpret science, make sense of science for a general audience, uh, be able to read scientific papers and make sense of those, uh, and communicate that science. But my job is creative. I work in the creative industries. So I make radio programs. We make a lot of the TV reports for European Space Agency. Uh, we make short films, uh, a number of podcasts, including the most popular space podcast in the UK, a super massive podcast. Um, and then I write, and I write for BBC Future website. And just going through that, well, the radio programs, they've got to sound engaging. They've got to have music. They've got to have texture. They've got to have interesting people. They've got to draw people in. The podcasts, they've got to be entertaining. They've got to, they've got to be more about the feeling than the facts. You don't want to, no one wants to listen to a podcast with a load of facts in it. Um, the TV and the films, well, it's all about the pictures and what they look like um, and how it fits together. Um, and then I write as well for, for BBC Future, and I don't think anything beats the... I'm one of these people, one of these writers, who I don't enjoy writing, but I like having written. So I like having written and completed. I've written a couple of books, but I like having completed them. Uh, and then you look back and think, well, that's a really nice sentence. I do like a nice, beautifully constructed sentence. And it's always nice to sort of look back and think, oh, I'm quite proud of that. Uh, and these are all creative. Um, so I sometimes get called a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I'm a creative person. And I would argue that most of you are, I'd say all of you, maybe apart from this one person here, <laughs> are as well. But I spent yesterday at a jazz workshop working on my jazz improvisation, on my clarinet. So uh, that's what I do. If I can make, uh, if I can make a full-time career or earn any money, frankly, as a jazz musician, I probably would uh, instead of doing what I do. <laughs> None of our or none of our panels that collapsed. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so art and arts, in their broadest sense, are vital for uh, for conveying ideas. Um, they go to the heart of, of what we are as humans. But um, it's also vital. You know, we're going to need all creative people if we're going to to leave the Earth, explore the Moon, onto Mars, all those things. Um, and that's what we're going to hopefully get from our panel. These, this panel is amazing. Um, no pressure. Uh, so first we have uh, Finn Strivens. Um, I'm just going to give a focus, like one line on these people, and I'll get them to explain a little bit more in a second about who they are, what they do. Uh, Finn is a designer, researcher, and foresight practitioner. That's so cool as a name. Uh, foresight practitioner. We'll find out what that is in a sec. Um, uh, then there's... Um, 
Anna Talvey, PhD student uh, on microgravity at UCL, uh, works with uh, for, the, for ESA uh, and is developing new spacesuit technology. Uh, we've got uh, Marta Zawadska. Zawadska? Zawadska. Yes, Zawadska. 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 <laughs> I'm really sorry if I mangle names. <laughs> I must okay. have just apologised. Um, now, Marta is an artist whose works can be seen in galleries around the world. Uh, I was looking at her website this morning. as a magnificent uh, picture of uh, Valentina Tereshkova. And, well, you can argue this, but I would argue that in space art, good space art, you can put so much more into that than you can of just a picture of Valentina Tereshkova, for example. And uh, Xavier de Castilla? Castilla? It's not like your Brick, mother. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, yeah it's close. not as good as your mother pronounced it. <laughs> uh, is an interplanetary architect. Um, it's been working on uh, 3D printing on the moon um, and looking at sort of a master plan, really, for a future lunar base. Uh, so let's start with with Finn. Um, well, what what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what, what is that actually? You know, this um, foresight practitioner, what, what are you actually looking at? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I think um, as a foresight practitioner, the simple term for it is imagining the future, but in a really structured way. Um, and by doing this really structured process, we, we create multiple different possible futures. So we're not trying to predict the future. We're trying to give different alternative visions which can guide decision making in the present. So would you say that's a sort of creative job or how does that, how does that work? What do you, do you do? Is it like a design agency where you just sort of sit around and have kind of ideas and write them down? Well, there's a little bit of that, yeah. I mean, I think it's a, a definite mix between analytical and creative. Um, there's a lot of research. So there's a, a thing we do called scanning, which is basically a lot of time spent just reading journals, looking at Twitter, looking for sort of sources of change in the world around us. Um, so that's quite a sort of emergent form of, of learning about the world. There are quite structured ways of learning about the world, doing uh, sort of in-depth uh, interviews with experts on the subject, and often non-experts on the subject because we want really fringe, uh, unusual ideas as well about what the future might look like. Um, and then there's a creative process of, of bringing all of that together um, into some kind of interesting vision that, that challenges us, because that's the point of a vision of the future uh, in my line of work, is that if it's four visions of the future, which you might expect, and they don't tell us anything new, then that's bad foresight. So I think we're really trying to get those edge ideas, um, to, to get ideas about the future that, that will challenge us and, and really make us think about the decisions we're making today. That's really interesting. So it's kind of at the interface of, uh, of science and, and the arts uh, there. Uh, let me come to Anna uh, next. Um, I know this is really dismissive of your work, um, but I put down, wrote down the words high-tech knitting. Um, but just tell us about what you actually are working on and, and doing. Um, I am, I'm working, yes, high-tech knitting for Sorry. spaces. <laughs> no, but it's, um, it, it is accurate. Because if you think about spacesuits, like the first thing people imagine is that it's super high-tech, newest technologies and everything. Whereas actually the opposite is correct. Spacesuits are actually in their technology, they're very conservative as vast majority of technology in space, right? Because it needs to be robust. You need, like it's tested for a very long time. And, and every, if you want to add any new technology, there, there needs to be a lot of money and research to make sure that it wouldn't fail. But at this, and, and there, then there are oh, sorry, all sorts of funding and, and issues why actually spacesuits are, are very dated in a way, and there are many problems with it. Um, and then there is the, the issue that um, spacesuits, EVA spacesuits, they're sort of like small human shaped space, uh, sh spaceships, right? They have all life support and, and a lot of you know, communications and all those engineered systems in them as well. So there is the question of, of should the spacesuit be engineered or should it be tailored? So where are the human aspects of it? Because engineered things are described with inputs and outputs, whereas 
human aspects are much more complex and you can't really quantify them often. So I am kind of trying to, first of all, describe what, what the human system in, in, in sort of quantifiable ways. And then how can I program this understanding into a textile into, so that the system is more integrated. So the human aspects of, of what are required of the suits um, and many of the engineered parts that actually with current technology can be integrated into a single material, into the structures of the material in, in, a, in a single manufacturing process. So you don't need to cut fabric, you know, you, you 3D print or, or you weld some metal parts and then you assemble everything together and then you test and then you glue some more wires on them. Da, 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 da. So you can actually make a much more elegant process and through this ele more elegant process you get a much more elegant functioning of the suit so it works better on a human body. That's really interesting. I think we'll come back to that, that idea of putting humans first, and putting humans at the heart of it and starting with the, the human. That probably feeds into what uh, Xavier's uh, work, works on as well. But let me come to Marta first. Um, in terms of yours, and, and I think I sort of alluded to this in the, in the opening, that you can do so much more in terms of um, articulating or talking about what's actually happening in a, in, within art than you can in a photo. What I what I do I I paint but uh, in fact I, I work in um, uh, with the energy with energy so uh, I um, hear my friends work with more with a uh, direction uh, with uh, the, they have a goal I I'm in fact on this first step I work more with energy and uh, my goal is to put on my paintings as much energy as it's possible to. Um, give for people a shot of energy to uh, go to some uh, some mm, to go uh, to take a step to some creative work so for example i work a lot of with um, with portrait and for me it's extremely interesting i i looking for a drive i looking for a drive i analyze what drive what um, what kind of character have my uh, have person which I um, uh, portray, uh, which who I portray, <laughs> and I want to put this kind of energy uh, in in painting. So uh, uh, I always, uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, in every human activity is uh, the purpose. Uh, the question why is is really important. So uh, many years ago, I put I put um, the question, and uh, and uh, because I'm architect. Uh, my, my background is architect for many years. I don't um, work in architecture, which was, of course, awesome and, and really great. <laughs> and I love that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that uh, painting, uh, it's not uh, just, uh, just a picture with colors. I, I play with colors. I, I really enjoy that. But it's always have uh, uh, a goal. And my goal is to, to give uh, people uh, energy. Uh, nice energy. So when um, my collectors, my clients, my uh, people who uh, follow me uh, uh, tell me that uh, they have a better day with my paintings, for me it's uh, really amazing. And um, I try not to deal with uh, some maybe not bad energy, but I, I, I don't do um, uh, therapy by my paintings or something, but uh, I'm really focused on, on what I want to communicate. And uh, to do that, I travel a lot. I, in fact, I don't work in uh, area of art, of area of galleries. I, I, I like to, you know, be, be a be a part of this kind of conferences. Of, for example, I uh, was time that I deal. Um, I was appear uh, very often on a Formula One, or a, uh, I was uh, cooperate with a rock stars. And for me, that was amazing because. Uh, observing a people and the goals of people, the drives, it's uh, totally um, amazing. And when I'm mm, able Let's come, to- We'll come oh, on to yeah. a bit more. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> it's we'll come so on to a bit more of it, because uh, really, it is really interesting. Um, but I want to come to uh, Xavier. Um, uh, and <laughs> uh, we were talking just before uh, the panel, and um, 
it, it's not an obvious connection between maybe architects and space or wasn't, but actually space exploration needs architects. Yeah, yeah, I would say any, any space there's humans in needs architecture, right? Um, do we don't need architects for the uh, James Webb telescope that we just saw the, the, the lecture before, which was amazing, I thought. Um, but the moment you put a human, I think, in a spaceship, in a capsule, in anything, you really need to think about that human first, right? And, you know, I'm quite uh, interested, if you, can, if you look at the current state of the ISS, for example, you know, that's not a space made for humans. There's just a space where the human is really just a subsystem in the engineering, right? That's how it's seen. That's actually how it's seen as well, both by the engineers, right? It's just one of the systems, right? Um, it was even on Skylab, I think. Um, I think the human, um, uh, the human aspect was just seen as a, a test case. It wasn't actually seen as a way to make it more enjoyable for the human, for the, for the astronauts. No, it was just like to kind of see if it actually did anything at all. So, um, so yeah, as I think that's why I think architects and designers are really important in space, to put a human perspective. But also we're good at, um, I think, bringing out an overall vision and not having to be an expert. I don't like to be an expert in anything. You know, I don't need to be an expert in anything. We're kind of the, there to be able to kind of listen to lots of people, listen to lots of engineers, to then take out all these bits and understand enough to come up with an overall view, with an overall vision, really. Uh, and that's the key, isn't it, Finn? It's, got a, it's the starting with the human, which scientists and engineers can often forget, because the ISS is a great example of... A, a terrible place for humans to live. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's, that's what makes it so important to do work and do engagement with people. So um, I think one of the original titles for this panel was going to be the sort of public engagement with the arts panel. Um, and I think that angle is, is really important, that we need to engage people in talking about this uh, more widely, um, you know, with yourself, but also beyond the people in this room who are already interested in the space sector um, and try to sort of start societal conversations about this um, and, and raise the awareness of it and, and understand more broadly what the sort of public perception towards these different things are. Um, I guess that's my, my interest and my take on starting with the human is uh, really go to people first, find out what they're interested in, what they want, what visions for the future they find appealing and let's try and design for that rather than starting with engineering and technology. Anna? Do you, I mean, is that, the, is that we often forget the human, or scientists and engineers often forget the human? Um, I mean, because I work with spacesuits, yeah. I, I don't think you can forget it. No. <laughs> I think you just see it in a very different way. And, and they're seeing us human, like we're talking about with the ISS, as like a subsystem, as a, as a thing, rather than as well, a... Well, I, mean, I think it's maybe the difference between, you know, the, those awesome-looking SpaceX spacesuits and the really clunky NASA-looking space. They sort of articulate a vision, don't they, for that future of well, space Well, I have to disagree with okay, you excellent. on the <laughs> SpaceX suits, because, first of all... Um, they are not comparable to the white EVA suits, right? Sure. Because the space SpaceX suits are just flight suits, mm. and and they are um, they 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 have different functions. Um, but but the fact that the SpaceX suits were designed by a costume designer, Hollywood, um, <laughs> Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood yeah, inspired yeah. by by some sci-fi. I am not a big fan of that. Right. Um, uh. I think um, the, I mean, at least in, in my work, how it ends up looking is driven by, by the technologies and the materials it's made of, right? Um, you know, think about the mercury, sil silver suits, and then actually afterwards, for a while, they already knew that they don't need the silver, but they exhibited everywhere the silver suits because they looked cool they and did hecky, look cool. right? Yeah, yeah. So um, one is like 
like driving the narrative and, and public interest. But I guess we are at this stage of, of human space flight right now that we don't need this. You know, it's, it's not like a sci-fi dream mm. anymore. There have been people living constantly on the ISS since 2000, right? Um, and there are new also commercial station, st stations being currently developed. And there is like a ecosystem planned and developed for, for orbit and for lunar orbit and planetary. So I don't, yeah, I don't think at, at 2022 we should be inspired by past sci-fi anymore. Mm -hmm. I think we we need to look into the future and and go go from there. Oh, that's really interesting. Mm. So, um, Xavier, how should we be inspired then? Because so, this has always bothered me with, say, Star Trek, mm. that the Enterprise it's pretty bleak inside mm. with all those kind of white walls. There's very, mm. very I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen a potted plant in the. Uh, <laughs> the Enterprise. It's kind of, you know, and all spaceships seem to be this kind of yeah. some sort of sci-fi industrial. Yeah. How do you make it more human then? Well, we don't need to get inspired by anything. But I don't think you get inspired. That's that's the wrong thing. So I'm kind of although I love sci-fi, right? Big sci-fi fan. But I actually try to not get inspired by it because sci-fi is just a stage. It's there to tell a story, right? I always wonder, why are there so many corridors in spaceships? In oh, Star yeah, exactly. Why? <laughs> of course, because they can have conversations walking along these corridors, yeah. you know? You'll never have that, right? It's, it's, it's so too would it expensive. Be, would, would it be more open plan then? So it's like, if you were designing the Enterprise, you'd have a well, kind of open plan working environment. I don't know yet, because I haven't designed it yet. See? <laughs> I, now you make me think about that. So, um, so I always think, like, you have to really go back to first principles. Right? What do you need? And there might be different visions out there for what interiors might look like right? in space. Like for example, here's, here's, here's a thought experiment. It's quite hard to grow stuff in space, yeah. right? to, to feed ourselves. You know, yeah. We need massive amounts of volumes to kind of imagine you have a moon base. You would have to have huge space to actually grow all your vegetables or whatever you need. But you could maybe grow bamboo, right? Because that's quite grows fast, it's quite dense, and maybe we use bamboo to build stuff. So actually, a rattan chair on the moon might actually be a very good solution because you might be able to grow your stuff that you build, build stuff out of on the moon. So maybe there is this kind of different vision of what moon bases might look like by stuff that you've grown there. Right? So I'm always kind of intrigued by kind of other, other visions out there that are different than what you see in sci-fi. Another interesting example I have is um, Halley 6. Halley 6 is an Antarctic base, uh, British Antarctic base. And the interior is, although I love, I love the project, the interior is a little bit bleak as well. Um, it looks a little bit like a lab. And I know of the people that live there that didn't quite like it because it li looked like they're living constantly at their workplace and they wanted something a bit more homey and a bit more tactile. So what they did is they took some of the crates, the packaging crates they had, took the plywoods they had from that, put it on the wall, some beading around it and to make it look like their local pub. I thought it was amazing. So they could have used material that was there to, to adapt their space completely. So that's why I'm interested in like, what would astronauts do? How would they adapt their own spaces to make it more tactile you know so and, and it's all this for sort of humans in space we're talking about all, all this this idea of you know that if we it, when we're going into space we need to take much more of our humanity our art our creativity with us yeah and i think um well we can't forget about all the um the other constraints, the more science and engineering constraints, we have, of course we have to tick all those boxes, but we have to go further, I think. That's important. Um, so yeah, for me, when I talked about that yesterday in my talk, you know, remember when I showed uh, designer Raymond Lowy, who um, they had to have a designer on the Skylab project, right, who decided there should be a window. There was a designer who pushed for it. And I think that's, you know, things like that, a view, 
Um, all these things are super important, I think. So, Finn, do we need to involve more creative people? You know, with so should this be? You know, should we be thinking not of if we're doing for space exploration, not just scientists, engineers? We need to pull in those creative people early on when we're thinking about missions with humans. I mean, yes and no. So <laughs> I think that creativity is really important. But I think the way I think of it is in terms of different forms of expertise, creativity being just one form of expertise. So creative people can be brilliant at imagining things, but ultimately our imaginations are completely informed by our lived experiences. And you can see that when you scan someone's brain, when they're imagining the future, the same bits of their brain light up as when they're thinking about their history and, and like, you know, remembering stuff. So if we put people, or we, if we find people with very different experiences, they will imagine very different things. Um, you know, if I'm thinking about building a, a space station for people 50 years in the future, I want really, really diverse people to be imagining that. Um, maybe you want, you know, some young people as well, because they will be the, the generation that's going to be actually living in it and, and sort of have a vested interest as well. So I don't think it's just creatives. I think it's mm. very diverse backgrounds in general. So who would like to live in a, in a spaceship a bit like, say, the Starship Enterprise? Would you actually want to live? <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of corridors. Yeah. Uh, we need some art on the wall, art on the walls. I mean, um, Anna, in terms of how does this work in practice in terms of bringing together uh, the s engineers, scientists, and artists without those scientists and engineers being dismissive of the art? You know, that you bring someone in, you bring a designer in just to, you know, to paint the spacesuit white at the end of the, act of the, of the process. How do you involve... Uh, creative people, how do you make it a much more creative process early on? I guess one thing is um, it's, it's not necessarily always separate because there are engineers and physicists who are incredibly creative, right? So it's not all engineers and scientists are, are dry and on their, stuck in their graphs, right? Um, Just this person here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in you know, there, as, as Xavier said, there, if, if you develop anything with humans involved, there needs to be an architect or, or from my side, a, human, a designer who works, has worked on, on humans included. Um, I think it is moving in that direction. If we think back um, the Apollo era, how th those suits were developed, right? So for a long time, the, the preferred suits that were developed were these hard shell engineered, they were AEX and RX suits, um, like Lithuan Industries made them. Because it was the principle, okay, constant volume, we engineer them as we engineer spaceships to make sure that we keep the astronauts alive. The problem was they, they didn't get them working well on, on human bodies and actually the, the tech, it, kept failing, like the helmet blew off and made a hole in the testing facility, right? <laughs> and then there was this small company um, called ILC Dover who developed this, this soft white suit. And they were originally a company that made women's bras and girdles, right? So latex. Yeah. So they were the expert of, of a new material called latex. Um, and, and, you know, the, they were... I think uh, fired, there's a great book by Nicolas de Monchot about it, you know. NASA fired them several times because ILC way of working was with textiles, you know. There was no engineering documentation. You can't, like, quantify all the processes when you, when you work with textiles and when you manufacture suits. There is, you know, the ILC seamstresses were like, yeah, like, you give me this piece of paper with... They, with all the engineering requirements, but I can't sew this piece of paper. Like every seamstress does it in their own ways. But long story short, the, the soft white suit made, sewn together by brass and girdles manufacturer, always outperformed the hard 
shell suits and actually how they kind of secured the contract with NASA was they didn't do a presentation with like charts and like the like numbers like okay this is the pressure this is the working life da 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 these are the materials they took them to the local school's football pitch and they had space suited in their suits they had space suited men play football because at that time compared to the metal hard shell suits which you know when you when you fell over you were like on your back like a turtle you couldn't get back up right so at the time the mobility and how it worked on the body was just you know out of the world amazing while still main maintaining all the life support so <laughs> very long story but but um you know, it's um, back then there was a huge gap because the 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 kind of the the seamstress was be, like it was a very long chain of commands until the seamstress, right? So right now, I guess it's it's closing up. So the the, the technologies between textiles, those people are actually sometimes working side to side to to engineers, and you know, like there are like hot like hard upper torso and like all this very engineered part like all the life support systems and everything to, that they work a little bit closer to make actually the systems more integrated so, uh, so it, the gap is definitely closing uh, and would you have any advice for people here in terms of working with creative people of bringing together groups because i mean particularly in academic institutions there is a tendency to work in silos isn't there or just work on a particular particular thing Yes, I mean, I think there are a lot of courses that are interdisciplinary, which sometimes they work really well. Um, but I get like it, within a team, we need people who are like really experts in their narrow field in the in the traditional sense of, of science with very deep knowledge of something. Um, and then I think we need um, people who have uh, like architects and designers who see problems more holistically. They, they, they tap into ver various things and they kind of, they test more widely um, in a sense. So um, yeah, I, I, th I think we, 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 you know, we definitely need both and you can't really force interdisciplinary work but you see, um, like, you know, like, for example, MIT is brilliant at it, right? So yeah. it kind of, they manage to create an ecosystem in education where this is like second nature that different disciplines collaborate. And Finn, that's sort of what you do, isn't it? I mean, could you have any advice for people here of how you bring, how do you make friends with artists or designers or architects or think about bringing them into the process and make it more creative? Yeah, I think um, a big part of it is just acknowledging each other's very different ways of working and, and thinking. So I think um, often scientists and, and artists have very different ways of, of knowing and learning about the world. Um, one being through trying things out and, and different sort of thresholds for what counts as sort of convincing evidence. Um, so I think having those really open discussions I found really helpful. Um, there are actually like toolkits even available online, which just almost help people lay out their process. You know, how do you work? What are the different steps? How do I work? And then work out, okay, what, what are the parallels in how we're thinking about the same process? So that you can see, even if they're taking a completely different approach to you, actually you're both on a learning journey. You're just learning through different tools and coming out with different kinds of insights that can then be paired together at the end. It just occurs to me that I'm wearing some space art here with this um, ESA branded uh, Jupiter. And I mean, Marta, th there's, uh, I think we're all better, at, uh, the space sector is better at embracing art and artists, isn't it? Um, you know, for, for me, uh, every uh, sector is quite art. Uh, uh, quite interesting, but I think in space, uh, people who uh, de deal with space, I can say, you know, <laughs> with this non-professional <laughs> language, uh, are uh, a more open mind. They uh, must be some kind of a, a rebel. So, 
from, you know, for, uh, uh, for me, a rebel is someone who's from definition uh, maybe more creative. I, I find so for a new, uh, new, uh, new way of thinking. And oh, here, my friend, I think he's a rebel. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a quite this interesting. Idea, <laughs> this idea we got right. Um, uh, I'm quite interested in the idea of communicating. We've talked about the communication and how what this panel was originally. Um, this idea of communicating the wonder of the space, really. But with art, because that's what this does, isn't it? It's sort of, you know, you might not like it, <laughs> but I, I it's drawing people into that, you know, using art as a way of drawing people in, or uh, art in its broadest sense. You know, what I do, I, I do uh, paintings, quite uh, large paintings, and it's a way of communication. Yeah, I, I took there some subject and uh, to maybe uh, make the subject close to, uh, to people. and. Mm, uh, yes, I, I uh, do that with a different also uh, area. Uh, but uh, um, for me, what I do, it's 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 my language, it's my way of communication. And when I'm uh, fascinated in an uh, area of space, and uh, you know, uh, this, uh, of course, uh, for me, the, the most um, interesting from a human um, a human side was uh, this story about, about uh, all, uh, Apollo 11, Apollo 13. Uh, um, you know, was thinking about what they, what these people in in this you know can had in the head. Uh, so it's 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 really I put this this uh, you know this energy in my paintings and share it to people. And I think uh, it's some uh, uh, it's some kind of communication, not direct, but uh, I, I put this energy. And if someone see that, that's great. And Zavia, I suppose it doesn't have to just be about humans, does it? Because I was thinking about all the robot missions we've been seeing. Mm. Um, and even when you, I think you mentioned that, did, what, Finn or you mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope, mm. there's, it's still, um, I mean, there's been a lot of art. There's, I think Mark McCochran had a, a logo on his shoulder. With it, mm. and that involves creatives. But with the rovers particularly, we sort of humanise those, don't we, and put that idea that it is a sort of, it's a human endeavour. There's art at the sort of, or arts at the heart of that, whether it's communication or using visuals or using mm. design. Yeah, and I think there's lots of, um, there's lots of been artists been been involved, great artists to kind of visualize things. You know, there's lots of um, artist impressions out there as well. You know, which, um, yeah, for me, it's always, the interesting thing for me is about the illustration and the and the, and the visual is so important. Um, it's mostly the time what the reason why I get contacted by people by companies or like oh you we saw your video on Mars can you do that for us or we saw this render us and can you do that for us and I'm like yeah of course but that's not what we do right that's just at the end of the process right I actually don't do it myself I actually get another company to do it for me even right I'll direct them so uh, the illustration is is great always, and and um, but it's the way to get there. I think is actually the design, which is completely different, right? Um, that's why I'm always quite keen to steer away from the terminology um, an artist impression, right? Kind of hate it, to be <laughs> honest, because. Um, uh, then when when I did my first kind of project in space, which, which was for ESA, which was for the 3D printed uh, moon habitat, um, we had to take a position. And uh, I looked at what kind of stuff was out there, and I saw two sides. I saw one side was lots of great research in detail, very technical, about very singular specific things, like an airlock on the moon, what would that be like, blah, 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 right? Now, on the other hand, I saw a lot of stuff that was the artist impression, which was a very loose drawing, I would say. It looked all rendered, looked kind of realistic. But when you look at it, when you thought about it a little bit deeper, it actually wasn't. So that's what I am always try to do in whatever we do, is to make sure that we are quite realistic and the visions that we put out there are quite, you know, quite feasible. Although we might have not figured out everything out yet, but that doesn't matter. But it is much more realistic than the pure artist impression, right? It's actually the design behind it, and it's a way where we, and maybe I want to add to that your, your, your previous question of how you 
how you all work together. Mm. Right? I've got a good example for that, how I bring in engineers and scientists is the following way. So a design process is a messy process. It's not, it's quite um, circular, right? Um, and what I do, what I'm actually doing in a few weeks is I organize a small symposium and I'm going to bring in lots of scientists, I'm going to bring in lots of engineers to come and spend a day with us, with my design team, on our new proposal that we have for uh, Lunar Base. What we're going to do is we're going to hang everything on the wall. And we've done this in previous projects as well. Bin it all up in a big room and everybody gets a red pen. Right. <laughs> And I want all these engineers and all these scientists that I have in the room, and probably have 10 of them, to pick the holes, to actually tell me what's wrong. Like, like what, is not, what is not working? Tell me, right? The great thing is, there's never a single vision. Everybody has different opinions. <laughs> I love to see the scientists and the engineers argue. It's brilliant, <laughs> right? And, but it's a fantastic day. And we normally start, the first thing we do is like they give, everybody can do like five minutes, five minutes tops, no, three minutes. I give everyone an introduction to themselves. And then we actually work together. And this is not about papers. This is not about a normal science process um, or engineering process. This is very in discussion and uh, back and forth. And it's super valuable for us. And some of the scientists actually said like, oh, Right, so you, you, you talk to everyone at the same time in one room. That's a bit mad, but um, we might do that as well. We might bring that back to our science department and, and see if that does something for us. So is that kind of design process, I think is really valuable in uh, developing these things. Oh, but really bring in the right people. And I bring in, the scientists I bring in is like, you know, for our Mars project, I had like a Martian meteorologist, I had a professor in mining, I had say, space psychologists, anthropologists, people from ESA, all sorts of people coming together in one afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I would like to be a fly on the wall for those. Well, you know, you're invited now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, uh, let's have some questions. It um, doesn't necessarily have to be on what we've been talking about, which is essentially about, you know, putting humans at the, the heart of this uh, and the importance of the arts in the broadest sense. But you must have questions and questions for any of the, the panel here. If you still don't entirely understand what Finn does, uh, feel free to, <laughs> <laughs> to ask Finn a, another question. Any questions for Marta, Anna? Uh, so, put your hand up. Yeah. Uh, we have got a microphone we can bring to you. And it's brilliant. There are two of you quite close together, so that would be quite easy. Do. Yeah, we do have a few online as well, so I can bring it up. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this question is mainly directed at uh, Xavier. Um, what is the difference between a designer and a systems engineer? Because um, from my understanding, a systems engineer also, you know, designs processes. Um, but yeah. Oh, that's a very good question, actually. Yeah, it's a hard one. Um, so we work with like system engineers at University of, of uh, Cranfield University. We've done that, um, and although these things seem to be quite similar, um, they are also quite different because as um, as an architect, you always think spatially, right? And that's really important thing, you know, to think spatially. Um, and I think this, this, I love to actually work with, with systems engineers, right? And I think our skills are kind of coming close, but they're not actually the same, right? And it mainly about how you visualize and how you communicate things as well. Um, nice example for our Mars mission, the project I showed yesterday, uh, we had a drawing that showed the architecture and we showed a drawing that shows the, the mission um, uh, engineering. And that was done mainly by our system engineers. And they had lots of spreadsheets, right? And lots and lots of spreadsheets, that connected spreadsheets. And it was really working with them, trying to figure out the data that we needed that actually kind of defined more the spatial organization. 
of it. Because with system engineers, it goes beyond the spatial in, in implementations, of course. So for us, it was mainly about the spatial implementation. So it's, they're kind of close, but they're not kind of the same. But I think I always find working with them is actually really interesting. So, um, so yeah, I hope that kind of gives you an answer. <laughs> Okay, let's have a, another question. I think there was another one on that same row. Yeah, hi. Hello. Um, feel free to disagree with me, but <laughs> this is more... Always a I great guess. start. Okay. Great. Right, uh, okay. Hit, hit us with it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a question to everyone, but I know Anna mentioned this. Um, I felt like there was maybe a bit of insinuation that scientists are like hard as a brick and we need to kind of get creatives into the field. But then I remember the previous talk about the James Webb telescope and how like a scientist that created the crazy spectroscopy telescope was very creative in their work. And maybe the reason why there's been some difficulty in trying to get creatives and scientists on the same page is because of this maybe bias that we have that scientists can't be creative or vice versa and don't you think that maybe that's what's been most damaging yeah that kind I mean, of mindset? Can I, i've been deliberately provocative because i would say that actually scientists are very creative and we sort of proved that at the beginning didn't we uh, apart from this uh, <laughs> um, the yeah and i think but i actually think there is a I, i'll let everyone else speak but i think there is a perception that like you say um and whether that's partly media as well, and I think sometimes scientists don't help themselves as well in their communication and thinking creatively and thinking, um, you know, I do quite a lot of media training of scientists and what we're trying, we're increasingly trying to get scientists to articulate emotions and feelings and how they feel about it, um, be more anecdotal, be more, be more human, essentially. Um, uh, uh, you know, and think about what um, you want people to take away from, say, a media interview, rather than um, what, w rather than information, rather than load people with facts. So, uh, yeah, I think in a way, uh, so my, I think scientists perhaps have a PR problem, and the perception of scientists and engineers has a PR problem. Um, that's my perspective. Um, let's see what other people think, Finn. Yeah, so I, I think it is, I don't think there is any sort of specific difference in mindset that has to exist. Um, lots of scientists can be really creative. I think within the innovation arena, if you're trying to make sort of radical and breakthrough innovation, it's very rarely uh, done. That, that's going to come out wrong. If, if you're in an innovation consultant and you were trying to say, let's build a radically innovative solution to this, I don't think you'd bring together a group of people who all think in exactly the same way. I think you deliberately try and get really diverse perspectives in the room. Um, so I think some of it is like, let's try and crack open some of these spaces. Um, but I don't think that there's a sort of mindset for a scientist and a mindset for a creative, and they're, they're totally different. Anna, does the, do you think the process of science sometimes limit creativity or the way that things have to be, have to be done? Um. Referring to Savier's yesterday, <laughs> I think uh, oftentimes like limitations actually make you more creative. I think I'm mm. okay. in the same yeah. way, right? Um, so, so no, I don't think the science process is, is limiting. I th what I see often from creative people is perhaps maybe they are limiting themselves i think it's it's not only like there is also kind of a perception that oh like scientists close off their world i no i don't think that it is i have knocked on a lot of doors being like a complete outsider and i have almost all like they all always hear you out and if you if you are able to communicate um, like this is what i want to do and this is what i'm working on and and if you are able to to say what you want to do in a way that is also understandable to them that is not kind of vague creative way but 
you know, one good thing about architects and designers is that our work usually involves a lot of prototyping. So I always took my prototypes with me. So even if, if my language wasn't so compatible with the science language at the time, I have a prototype and I can refer. And that was always like raised interests because you, oftentimes in, in science and engineering, the, the prototyping is outsourced, it's subcontracted. Whereas we often are more closer to the prototyping process. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's, it's I, I fully agree with, with you and Ben what, what I said before. It oftentimes just comes down to communication. There, no one has filled any walls or, or barriers. You have to find a way of, of a, a common language because often you actually think closer than you, than you think, but it's, it's a matter of, of how you explain it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, another <laughs> question. Uh, we've got qu other questions on the... We do have a few, although they are quite specific, but one of them is for Anna. Um, well, it's kind of related. Um, so someone's asking here if you could elaborate on how your certs are faulty. So what's the fourth dimension? Uh, what is, I'm sorry, I didn't hear Yeah, that. if you could elaborate on how your certs are 4D, so what's the fourth dimension? Uh, the fourth dimension. That's what's being asked. Okay. <laughs> um, um, so basically, spacesuits are, are um, the, the, the textile parts are similar to clothes what you wear right now. So they are, you know, they're cut from textiles in general or flat, it's because of the technology and, and the textile the technology is optimized for mass production, right? So textiles in general are flat and then you cut out shapes that they are called patterns, flock patterns, which are kind of standardized for, for humans. And whereas Apollo spacesuits, they were bespoke made for each astronaut, the current spacesuits are in, in standard sizes, small, medium, large, different parts. Um, so, but, so basically, if you assemble these pieces, you get a 3D shape, right? But uh, it, it's just one 3D shape. So if you think about yourself throughout the day, how many movements you make, what is the D movement? What is the zero position you have? It's, it's very hard to tell, right? It's even more difficult to tell for an astronaut because in microgravity or in partial gravity, you move different. At the ISS, you know, you, you don't, you walk with your hands. Your shoulder joint has three degrees of freedom. You, you use a lot of that. And basically the rest of your body is kind of a vegetable, right? You don't move much your legs or torso. You know, you, you like, your body doesn't balance everything out. You, you don't have any of these torso, torso movements. So, so what is, the question is, what is the 3D form? There is none. That, that was kind of the principle of our like, okay, the suit, the textiles, they need to be engineered in a way that we, um, that basically I, I program in the, I mean, in my PhD, I first of all study uh, with, with strain maps. What is the mapping of the surface of the body um, that you have throughout the day and what are the, there are actually common lines, so there are lines of non-extension and there are lines of major strains that are characteristic for types of people, like for example astronauts, right? So there is a way to actually, with current technology, to understand and quantify that. So if we have this 4D mapping of a body, how do I translate this into a material that is, it's not just flat 2D, it's not just 3D shape, but it actually, the movement is engineered into it. So you, you know how and when it needs to move with, with, with the body and expand with the body and, and which, which part needs to be static. Interesting, that's interesting. Well, it's funny you said about the um, legs because I interviewed um, Italia, uh, Italian Easter astronaut uh, Luca Palmatano a couple of years ago and he was talking about the idea of, of, um, 
of breeding a future GM astro genetically modified astronaut uh, with four arms because mm. he said his legs were completely useless. Uh, yeah. everyone. I mean, it was, you know, I don't think genetically modified astronauts is necessarily the answer to that, but it was uh, as an interest, interesting idea. Uh, let's, uh, another question. Yes, sorry. Uh, Sum up here. Hiya. Um, first off, big champion of STEAM and everything, but uh, looking at kind of the, the evolution of STEAM, being that STEM was kind of a, a way to champion uh, hard sciences again and getting it back in schools, and then we've added STEAM. Why, why do we just call it like education, innovation, and partnerships as opposed to bringing the arts and humanities back into science together? Only reason I ask is I get this question all the time. Yeah, completely agree. That's my perspective. Xavier? What was it? What, sorry, I didn't quite yeah. hear the question. So why what? do we even have STEAM? Why don't we just call it education? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it basically pulls the whole. Yeah, no, I, I I I agree actually, and and because I found being an architect is such a kind of a field where creativity and engineering and science all comes together. You know, and going back to the question, of the lady over there, like um, you know, we need to, as architects, need to be very technical if if we're going to work in space. You know, and I hate other architects, for example, proposing stuff in space that's completely sci-fi right i can't stand that because we're not sci-fi artists architects right <laughs> like glass domes on mars and the moon please right uh, if i see that i just go oh, get niche um so i think it's 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 really for me i really don't see like a massive difference sometimes in engineering creativity um and design are for me the best people are the ones that are able to kind of bring all these things together right and um i you know there's actually very few courses that um do these crossovers really well i actually did my degree of architecture at an engineering school you know which was terrible in the crossover really between architecture and engineering but at least we were kind of an engineering environment um and yeah i think yeah it is i think education it's not it should not be in different streams i think these things are and i think architecture itself is, is a great example of that you know because i talk to technical people and engineers all the time and i love working with them because i love constraints I love to kind of work within. That's why I kind of love working in space because, geez, there's a lot of constraints, <laughs> right? The most boring thing to get as an architect is a project where you have unlimited funds and no real brief. The most boring thing ever, you know. Um, difficult. I mean, it's difficult. You can't. What do you do, right? It's not pure. <laughs> like architects are not artists. We can't do something out of pure creativity. That's not what we do, right? We have clients right it's very specific always so uh, i mean i don't know whether i can just answer your question directly because uh, i think there's an i do think there's an issue in schools that mm. actually dividing the two up and forcing particularly in the uk i don't know what it's like uh in, in other parts of europe or um of forcing children to make a decision mm. early on whether they're going to do science or they're going to do <laughs> arts subjects i mean for example i ended up doing three science A-levels, which massively restricted what degree I could do. Whereas actually my best subject at school was English. And I ended up with a biology degree, which makes no sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I do think, I, I mean, I guess the point of STEAM is to that don't, yeah, actually it's a good idea in that it, it's what we've been talking about is pulling, thinking more creatively and pulling uh, and making that point that there isn't actually a distinction. It should all be together but I do think I mean I personally feel there's a there's an issue in uh, in schools with this uh, can we I think we've got time for one more question uh, yeah I think we have time for one more so then you can wrap one up one more enough yeah one yeah more. one more question right who's got the best question uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's prepared to commit there. that they've got the best yeah. best got, got one here who do you think you got the best question or do you think you've got a better so question? She's shouting, we, so. we have someone up here who's very <laughs> okay <got> <laughs> Um, so, hello. I wanted to ask, how do you define creativity? So, in the beginning, you asked us... Sorry, can you say that again? How do you define creativity? So, in the beginning, you asked us to raise our hands. 
uh, who were the scientists. And then you asked us to raise our hands. Who are the artists, musicians, um, and writers? But how do you bridge the gap between the two? Or in another way, if I can rephrase the question, is how well do you agree with the statement of is creativity um, or creativity is not a magical act of inspiration, it's the result of hard work and dedication. So how well do you agree with that statement? Thank oh, you. Great question. Marta, do you oh, want that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea about that. <laughs> I, I think that's part of the beauty of it, isn't it? You know, uh, I, uh, in uh, my uh, normal uh, life, I, I don't use a... Um, word artist or creativity uh, I'm more thinking about the uh, curious and solving and uh, so solving solving problems solving pro yeah. and solving problems and uh, it's you know in my work uh, I have this great area when I be uh, as a child and I can play with colors but uh, I have also this background which is not maybe uh, seen and which is awesome for me also and I can um, act there more as an engineer and uh, some kind of architect. For example, when I must uh, prepare, uh, prepare um, packing, or when I uh, somewhere uh, somewhere where I don't have any suppliers and what to do to support my paintings to ship or to how to deal with duty with uh, lawyers sometimes. And if I take a look uh, on my uh, way of thinking, in in my opinion, it's in fact the same way of thinking. Way of thinking when I paint, or it's uh, it's my opinion. It's uh, just about the curiosity and this force to solve the problem. And I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I like a lot of uh, a lot of areas, and uh, I don't like to uh, separate people for a creativity mind or for a artist. Uh, for me, our people are open mind and want, want to solve the problems. That's a great answer. So I think maybe your answer, it shouldn't be creativity, it should be curiosity. Yeah. And, and, and thinking lateral as well. I think that's a, a, a very simple practical example from, from our practice is that we, we need to design furniture on our Mars base, our Mars habitat, right? And of course, you want to, whatever you bring to Mars has to be compact, has to be lightweight. So we could have spent a long time really thinking how do we design the lightest possible chair and all that. We didn't do that. We actually thought about just 3D printing our chairs and our furniture out of the waste plastics that the Mars habitat would have. So we didn't really kind of dive into that one chair and try to get all the, you know, the brief was make it light and, and compact. No, we actually didn't make it light. It was actually heavy and not compact at all, but we just used stuff that was already there. So I think for me, that's creativity, right? To try to think a little bit lateral, to try to think without, outside your own kind of stream of thoughts and try to do different things. For me, that's creativity. And yeah, and a lot of hard work, yes. I'm aware that everyone wants to get their lunch, so uh, let's end it there. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, Xavier Marta. Anna and uh, Finn. We'll, I'm certainly standing around for lunch. I don't know whether you guys are, so do come and ask uh, questions afterwards. And thank you very much. And thank you, Rito. <laughs>
starting the event in the next five minutes. Uh, everyone's coming in from their lunch. Everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I hope you guys have had a great lunch, and uh, I would like to say thank you to Reaction Engines for sponsoring today's uh, lunch. So now we have Dr. Datina Zali, who'd be talking about how to succeed in a STEM career with a focus in space. Over to you. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this um, very excellent conference. So I would like to give a talk on how to excel in a scientific career um, with a focus in space based on my experience um, as, a, as a senior lecturer and having worked with students for a long time. So this is a little bit um, a background of uh, myself. You will see that I'm a cancer cell biologist. So um, I've worked at um, different institutions starting from University of Harvard where I've spent six years um, doing research focused on cancer cell biology as well as um, directing courses for undergraduate students and PhDs at, um, in uh, cancer cell biology, biochemistry and genetics. Um, after that, I moved um, to University of Oxford where um, I was working on uh, precision cancer medicine with other uh, very well-known professors. Um, in education, uh, this was basically a course educating healthcare professionals, medical doctors um, coming from different backgrounds on personalized medicine and genomic medicine, which I'm doing now at Imperial College London. Um, throughout my career, we've had um, working with um, scientists from all over the world, including um, scientists in NASA. And um, I've always been interested in space ever since a young age. However, um, especially in the last few years, we, I have uh, had the opportunity to work with, as I said, with a, with a very um, excellent scientist from NASA analyzing uh, data uh, that from the experiments done in space. And I'm now moving to the aeronautical engineering at Imperial as well, where I'm going to focus more um, in space. 
In this presentation, I'm going to focus on three main things. I'm going to talk about the WISPIC Science, which is a non-profit organization, um, the aim of which is to elevate STEM, to elevate life through STEAM education, uh, the activities that we do at uh, WISPIC Science, and how it supports professional development. Um, I would like to start this presentation by um, a very important quote that we all know, education is the mother of uh, leadership. It's the key to leading and to having a successful career. And we all know that the year, new year of success is focusing not only on the grades that you will get in your bachelor's degree or your master's degree, but it's also important on the leadership activities, the work experience that you have. Also important in networking, how do you network with other leaders, with other people in education, in industry, and other related topics of interest that you are interested in. Um, also important communication, how do you come across to the other leaders, what skills do you use, and how do they look at you. So these are all key things that one needs to have in order to be successful. I've had the luck of interviewing many students um, at different institutions, at Harvard, at Oxford, and when we have a student coming to us for a master's degree or for, um, for um, interested in courses or research, we, we decide on how good they are also based on the other factors as well. Work experience that they have and how do they explain research. So we don't only base on the, on the degree grade that you have. Okay, so these are other important things. Um, so as a, this is summarized here as well, the degree and the work experience, the network that you develop yourself will create excellence. And um, this is what we are aiming to focus at WISPIC Science by giving the students and yourself the ability, the opportunity to collaborate with other scientists on a research project on a topic that they are interested in. And um, our motto uh, is to educate and innovate and to elevate life through STEAM education uh, by generating new leaders uh, that become independent and that are able to solve any, any problems that they might face. So at the moment, we're, our team consists of many where well, our students are of different um, internationals. We work with some of the students in the US, in the UK, Europe, but also Asia, who come and, um, and um, work with us. And um, our team consists of world-class scientists and lecturers from the top institutions in the world. And um, we offer them, as I said, um, experience, work experience, um, where they are going to be involved in different STEAM activities, focusing on solving a real um, life challenging, real life problems. For example, we give them data from the lab and ask them, what do you think this means? Can you analyze this data? So basically, they are, um, we, we would like them to experience that real feeling of what is being a scientist uh, like, whether you want to be um, a space well, with a scientist uh, focusing on space biology or otherwise. And um, we have, as I've mentioned before, in the recent years, we focused quite a lot on space and we have uh, many different science activities um, with a space focus. And one of the competitions that we have, for example, that's still going on is we speak science up to the space competition that will be judged by some of the scientists in NASA, ESA, and um, University of um, Oxford and Harvard. All students can participate from all over the world. Um, and basically, they can partic participate in two different ways, um, <clears throat> which I will explain later. Um, they, their main aim is basically to um, express their innovative, bold, and limitless, limitless imagination in different science-based topics. So, as long as it's related to space, they can present any topic that they might um, want. And they can do it in two different ways. One of them is through constructions with safe materials, for example, rocketry, satellites, and rovers. And uh, they can also do it in a different way 
which is a research article writing. For example, if you have some data or if other scientists have published data and you've analyzed them, you can write a research article based on something that somebody else found, but you can make it yours by adding your input on it as well. Like, what does the data mean? What do you think it's happening? And how do you see it going forward? What are the future, um, the future, um, <clears throat> how do you predict that this is going to be? So, as I've mentioned before, this competition is still going on where everyone can participate. It's free for everyone. And the deadline is uh, March 31st, so the end of the month. We've done these projects also for high school, which is not your age, but I just wanted to give you some example that we, that we did for the high school students as well. And this is some of the students have built this, um, let's say this rocket, and some of the examples are here. And this is an um, 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 article, for example, that a science, has, a, well, a young student has written whether water is found on Mars South Pole. And uh, this will be published at We Speak Science. So these are the different ways that you can participate. And as I've mentioned, the deadline is Mars, March 31st. And um, so basically, uh, I've already mentioned that we offer these STEAM activities, which will focus on solving a real life challenge or problem. And we focus on four main criteria, which is the critical thinking, the teamwork and delegation, because students will work in pair with other international students. Um, research and analysis, as well as we teach them courage and confidence. And these are very important because um, you need to also have the courage to do new things, to try new things. You need to be confident. Um, you need to take, and you need to think that there is nothing that I can lose by participating. Um, um, and apart from this, we're also offering some other um, STEM modules or STEM programs, which some of them focus on real life science and engineering. We also, where students can um, work directly with the scientists. Um, so this will be a collaboration work directly with the scientists where they will, for example, meet on a weekly basis, two weekly basis or a monthly basis. Um, on a particular project. And um, at the end of the, their work, they will also need to present the project and write a scientific article in collaboration with that, with that scientist that they are going to work on. And um, yeah, as I said, um, we are also going to, this is not shown here, I had a slide here as well, I'm not sure why it's not showing, but we're also going to offer a space biology course, and the space biology course will start soon in September, where students can participate, and um, this space biology course will focus on space biology, um, on the cutting edge research that's actually happening right now. And again, it will be in collaboration with some scientists from NASA, and some of, them, some of the lectures will also come from Harvard and University of Oxford. And, um, these courses are also going to be um, online, but it will be live sessions where every weekend, every, well, every week, um, you will have the opportunity to work during these sessions directly with the scientists, and they normally uh, last about three hours. And um, one of the aims of the We Speak Science that I've also mentioned is to increase the diversity and to uh, increase the collaboration with other international students that share the same passion as you share. Um, we also have the motto of we share the same, um, we are all the same, we, we have, um, irrespective of nationalities, religions, or um, whatever you might think of. So we really embrace diversity and different cultures so that you guys can work together with other scientists, with other uh, students from all over the world and uh, can uh, expand on more on your interests. And if you want to join us, you can email me at tetinazali at wespeakscience.com or you can email at info at wespeakscience.com and you can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, 
that's all my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. And these are some of our students. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, open for questions now for the next five minutes. If you have any, uh, if you can raise your hands, please. So you mentioned that we can do research projects and we can connect with like scientists or a mentor. Would that be done online or physically meeting them? Yeah, so it's going to be all done online because our team obviously come from multidisciplinary and they're not only in the UK. So it's going to be online. So basically research is basically when you analyze the data, when we give you a specific data mm -hmm. and you, we train you on how to do it and you can analyze the data. But this is part of one of the, the courses that we do in STEM, but this is something done online, but there's a lot of support in terms of, for example, as I mentioned, every week or every two weeks, you meet with a mentor and you see, you know, how are you doing, any difficulties that you're experiencing, so yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you so much.
So I think we're going to start now. So let me introduce our lovely speaker. So our next guest is a seasoned entertainment entertainment industry executive. She is the founding partner and co-CEO of Space Hero, as well as a member of the World Economic Forum, representing the Global Future Council on Space. Her talk today will be on democratizing space, so please allow me to introduce the wonderful Deborah Sass. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. How are you? So, thank you very much, Jess. First of all, I'd like to thank the UK SEDS. I'd like to especially thank Joshua and Joanna. I've never actually met them, but they're the ones that fielded all the questions we asked over the last five weeks. Now, I have a question for you guys, and I want to understand, even though there's a little less than 500 people in the audience, which is what they told me was going to be here, but that's another story. So, who wants to go to space? Hands up. Right, pretty much, oh, pretty much everybody. And uh, who wanted to be an astronaut when they were younger? Right. Now the big question is, who wants to work in the space business? All of you, excellent. So, I'm here to tell you that for somebody with no education, with no money, with no access, I've never been to university, I am a woman of colour, I live on a farm in Ibiza, I grow my own vegetables, and I can get you a job in space. Well, it's possible. So, what is Space Hero? I want to tell you a little bit about it first, and then we're going to dive into explaining to you how it might be possible that you can do what I've done. So, Space Hero is a global casting show. That's television, by the way. You know, the old school thing used to be in the living rooms. Space Hero is a global casting show sending one lucky winner into space every two years for the next 30 years. Who's heard of Space Hero? Wow. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, the investors have, so that's good. So, Space Hero is... Space Hero is a company that started many years ago. In fact, where I grew up in Isleworth is a little bit up the road. And um, I, went, I lived on a council estate and I uh, grew up not really knowing anything about space. It wasn't, I'm not a sci-fi person, I didn't watch Star Trek, I didn't grow up with that. And so when my now business partner of the last five, almost five years rang me and told me about Space Hero, I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Sorry, I wasn't supposed to swear. Cut that bit out. <laughs> so, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got here in the beginning. So, I've just told you what Space Hero is. We're going to go back to that in a minute. But as I said, I grew up on a council estate not far from where I'm talking. And uh, there wasn't really any access. Um, I'm good at talking, I'm good at being passionate, I'm good at making money, I've done that my whole entire life, but I didn't have that academic flair that you all have. In fact, you're all miles ahead of me, because you're all in university, right? I'm going to assume you're all in university. Okay, so when I was looking for a job 25 years ago, does anybody know what a newspaper is? Yeah, just checking. So you would go to the newspaper, to the back of the local newspaper, I was living in Ealing at the time, and there would be classified ads. They're little ads. And one said, do you want to sell space? And I was like, oh, I want to work for NASA, that's cool. So I ring up the number, and the woman laughs, and she says, you've got a very good personality, <coughs> by the way, we're not talking about selling space as in working for NASA, we're talking about selling space as in advertising space. I don't even know what that was. Cut a long story short, 25 years later, not only do I work with almost every leader of every space agency in the world, I work with probably all of the major space companies in the world, and as the lovely Jess has already said, I sit on the World Economic Forum board on their Global Space Council. All sounds a bit fabulous, but 
it's all been a lot of hard work. So I learned the three lessons at school, which has helped me. And I, I kind of want to give you guys a sense of, it doesn't matter what you look like anymore. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't even matter about your education or access or money. What, what really, really matters as an entrepreneur in any industry, but it has certainly served me well in space, is passion, passion, and passion. If you really are passionate about something, you get up every morning like I do, and I go, cool, I get to go to work. That's amazing. I get to do something that is disrupting a global industry. And let's face it, space is the most inaccessible industry in the world. If you're not super smart, if you don't have tons of money, if you're not in the military or you're not a trained astronaut, how do you even get into the space industry? So let me tell you how I did. So about three and a half years ago, my business partner rings me. I was in my sister's house in Notting Hill, up the road again from here. And it was December. I just remember it was a bit super cold, maybe four years ago. And he rings me and he says, I want you to help me launch Space Hero. And I'm like, Thomas, that sounds cool. What's Space Hero? And he said, it's a global casting show giving away the biggest prize ever given out on television. A $55 million ticket for a 10-day stay on the ISS. And I was like, sign me up. That's amazing. I'm in. I just got one question. And he said, what? And I said, what's the ISS? Because <laughs> I literally didn't even know then, four years ago. So four years ago, I knew nothing about the space industry. And now I sit on a global board that makes decisions for the space industry. I mean, what the amazing. My mother, when I told her, she said, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. She's crying on the phone. She was like, this is amazing. I can't wait to tell your family. I was like, mum, do you know what the World Economic Forum board is? And she went, no, but I'm just so proud of you. It sounds so fabulous. I was like, okay, great. So how did I start? As I said, Thomas and I went to a conference about four years ago in Luxembourg. In fact, I googled space conferences <laughs> Europe. I live in Europe and I was apparently going to be in the space industry. And what came up was New Space Luxembourg. I said, Thomas, I found it. We're going. I'm buying tickets. I went to the website and I saw 60 photos, little thumbnails of the speakers. So people just like me back then. And I recognized two names, Deloitte and NASA. Of course, everybody knows NASA. And I thought, okay, how do we do this? I know nobody in this business. I am a complete nobody. So like the mini detective I thought I was, I went online and I found the email addresses for 35 of those 60 speakers. And I sent a one paragraph email to every one of them. And I said, hi, my name is Deborah Sass. I'm new to the space industry. I would love to buy you a coffee because I'm coming to your event in three weeks' time. 22 people wrote to me. And every one of those people, four years later, is an investor, is a partner, and some of them even work for me today. That is how you hustle. And when you don't know something about something, an industry, you just got to go out there and put yourself out there. Now, I'm not saying that's for not everybody can stand in front of people. Not everybody can talk to people. I understand that. But fundamentally, it was the passion that myself and Thomas showed in an industry that we knew nothing about. Now, I have a shaved head. You can see that. I'm small, brown, and quite extrovert. My business partner is six foot five. He's got long hair. He's white. He's German, and he wears porn star clothes. We're from the music business, right? This is actually what we did. We are from the entertainment tech business. And we walked in to an event, imagine you lot, but older, 
and obviously probably with more money because they're all uh, entrepreneurs and like running space companies. And Thomas and I walk in and there's this short brown woman with a shaved head, there's a tall guy with a porn star glasses, and there's 350 scientists and astronauts and military people, and they were like, who are those two, right? Because we just look so out of place. Very, very slowly, we worked on explaining to people very quickly what we were doing. And as I say, four years ago, I knew nobody in the space industry. But here's another question for you guys. How many space agencies exist in the world today? Shout out some numbers. NASA's only one of them, by the way. Come on, don't be shy. 10? 10? 50? 50? 50? 100. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, now, now we're just guesstimating. There are, and you, by the way, feel free to use this at your next in a party, it's quite interesting information. Most people in the space industry, which you are all in, don't know this. There are 68 space agencies in the world. 68 countries in the world, outside of one being America, have space agencies. And you know what I did over lockdown and over COVID on my farm in Ibiza? Is I rang every head of every space agency in the world. And when you guys go to my website, spacehero.org, it's the business part of it. I'm gonna tell you about the consumer part where you can pot oop, pot potentially go and uh, potentially get some jobs, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So there are 68 space agencies in 68 countries. That means that almost a third of the population or a third of the countries in the world have a space agency. Amazing, like amazing. These are making policy, they are spending money, they are educating. And you know, the one common theme they said when I rang them and told them about this crazy idea called Space Hero was, thank you. And I was like, what do you mean? We never get called. We never get anything from a Western country or a Western company. We're like, the Nigerian Space Agency, the Angolan Space Agency, the Brazilian Space Agency, the Indonesian Space Agency, that is almost eight times the size of the UK just in those four countries, and we don't always work together. Why is it so important that we work with lots of different countries around the world? Because how do you say you're a global movement if you're only working with America and ESA or the UK or, you know, countries? So we're very global. So we have a grassroots movement that we have started literally from me in the beginning, making phone calls, sending emails, talking to people, going to conferences around the world. We are now, we're not public, which is why none of you have ever heard of Space Hero before. It's okay, you all know about it now. We are in over 82 countries. I have thousands and thousands of volunteers, of supporters. In my own team, on our payroll, we speak 14 languages. I have 27 people in 14 countries who are working, making sure that this company is available to you guys. And what are we actually doing? We're making space sexy and cool and pop culture. We're taking it out of the realms of, when you were six, everybody wanted to be an astronaut. By the time you're 16, it's pimples and puberty, and you kind of forgot your dream. And Space Hero is gonna bring it back. One country, one person, one organization, one community at a time. And we've done pretty well so far. So I'm glad that you guys are all virgins to Space Hero, but that is no longer. Because when we eventually announce at some point in the next few months that we have a mission, which we've always had, by the way, I can't talk about it publicly, but let's just say the only other company to take you to space is not Roscosmos. So we've uh, been working with them for over three and a half years. We have a team of 
executives that can execute on the business, the TV show, building the metaverse, building the app, all the things that you need when you're running an online business and doing stuff physically in various countries. But one of the things I noticed in your group in your last talk was that people are really interested in getting into the space world. And I really want to implore you, that of course, if you're you know, a physicist or a scientist or in your academia, that's fine, totally cool, but there's another route. And it's actually through us because we have a very big footprint and we work with all of the media outlets. We work with all of the streaming platforms. We are in talks with Fortnite, Roblox, all of these guys, TikTok, Twitch, everybody that you've heard of will eventually be part of the Space Hero ecosystem. So I've told you a little bit about Space Hero. I've told you about my lack of information four years ago for the space industry. And now I want to tell you a little bit about where we are today. So we are running a digital activation. So everybody on social media here? Yeah, I'm going to assume so. Good. So we are Space Hero is our handle for everything that we do from TikTok to, to Instagram to Facebook to LinkedIn if you're on that. And you can actually apply for free and pre-register to be part of our insider network. Our insider network is people like you guys that have an interest in space, but maybe you don't want to be a rocket scientist, or maybe you do, but you actually want to be part of something and a movement that is global and that can really change the direction of, again, taking it out of the realm of people who are really interested in space to all those other people that maybe a little bit they know, but they don't know how to get into it. They're not smart enough to be in this room, but they have some interest in space. And that's our job. Space Hero is really here to connect people. And space, outside of food, music, sports, and probably sex, space is a global conversation. It transcends gender, religion, language. So really, we all learn about it when we're a kid. So how do you disrupt that industry? You make it accessible to people who aren't necessarily in the industry. Cool. So where are we today? We are launching very soon. You can be involved in Space Hero by going and looking at We Are Space Hero. It's all there online. I'm sure you guys are much more savvy about uh, social media than I am. And you can be part of the team. Come today. Now, what is going to happen in the next few months in the space industry. I would like to think that the space industry is really, really going to explode. Space is so hot right now, everybody seems to want to be part of it. So, I'm gonna take a few questions. I'm gonna let you guys ask me some things that you wanna know. And you guys are definitely more experts in space than I am but I kind of know a few things that maybe you don't know. So, here's your opportunity, ask away. We are Space Hero. Fantastic, can we all give a round of applause for Deborah, please? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so David is gonna come around with a roving mic, so if anyone has questions, just put your hand up, David will come to you, so you can ask your questions. Otherwise, you can submit your questions uh, via phone, uh, if you have signal in here, um, and we can see them that way, okay? But remember, this talk was originally supposed to be in LT2, so click on that to find Deborah for Deborah's question, okay? So, first questions, please. Yeah, okay, over there. Hi, Deborah, cheers for that. Um, Hello, you're welcome. <laughs> if I was to sign up to the Insider Program, yes. what could I expect? Good question. You're going to expect 30 minutes of your life that you will never get back again <laughs> because it's a 30 minute questionnaire because we want you to be very, very sure you want to be on this journey with us. What you'll get is access to the team now. You'll get access to what we're doing before anybody else does. 
you'll get access to some of our cool merchandising. We all love a bit of free swag, I know that. <laughs> um, and a few other things, but you'd have to sign up first to, uh, to get access. Does that answer your question? Cool. Next question. Uh, yes, um, firstly, you might thanks have to remove you, I'm sorry. Thanks. Firstly, thanks for the talk, that was very good. Um, Thank you. And <laughs> I just wanted to ask, uh, what actually is that forum that you're on? I'm in the same boat as your mother, I guess. I haven't <laughs> heard of it. And by the way, I was too. So the World Economic Forum is kind of like the private version of the UN. So it's funded by huge corporations, but it's also not-for-profit. So it's a, not a charity, but it's run kind of like one. They own Davos. Do you know what Davos is? So Davos is it's been going about 50, 60 years. It's in a place called Davos in Switzerland, and it's where every leader of every country in the world meets to talk about poverty and climate and space policy and, and all sorts of things. Space is a tiny little subsection of it, um, well, it's a, a section. But the World Economic Forum is, they have about 30 different forums for every, I suppose, industry sector in the world, from space is just one of them, there's 29 others. Um, when I sat on the board, the very first time I was invited, I actually said to the guy, I'm not making the coffee like, why would you? And he goes, Tevra, he said, you're the, uh, you're the only company in the space world that has put dozens of space companies and government departments together in one place. Nobody's done this, not even NASA has done this. We want you guys to be the voice of the punter on the street. I was like, cool, sign me up. And I got on the meeting and the sweat was dripping down my back. And I'm on Zoom, right? I wasn't even in real life. So I'm sitting and there's like the head of the UN and like the head of the uh, Bahraini Space Agency, the UAE Space Agency, a couple of astronauts, like people from Lockheed, NASA. And I was like, oh my God. And I asked one question the first time. And the guy who runs the forum is like, Deborah, you're here to disrupt. And I was like, okay. And I said, you know what? I keep getting asked about the billionaire space race silence on the screen and 26 people looked at me and one person who will remain nameless and of course somebody asked me a direct question about him and he said that's a stupid question Deborah it's so irrelevant it doesn't even deserve an answer and I was like wow this shit is real huh <laughs> and I'm gonna keep going and that was three board meetings ago and now I'm helping them all talk to the media isn't that funny? They're all doing little videos and making themselves cooler. So. so, does that answer your question? But look it up. It's kind of cool. They do lots of stuff. Next question. Come on. Any girls here want to ask me a question? Come on, someone. Surely. <laughs> surely. You've just listened to this amazing talk. Come on. Okay, we've got one. We've got one. I know. Yeah. You know what? We'll allow it. We'll allow it. You have a very nice coloured shirt on, though. <laughs> Yeah, so you said about um, sending someone to space um, every two years, mm -hmm. and you said about 55 million fund, and that's like a lot of money, so kind of where's that money coming from? Is it partnerships or...? Fair. It's a great question, thank you for asking it. So we're privately funded, but here I'll give you a hint on how the media business raises money. So when you have an idea and people like it, they genuinely tend to be part of a community. When you build a community, not 50 or 60 people, but 50 or 60, hundreds of millions, thousands, right, of people, these are called eyeballs. And these eyeballs are valuable to organizations, to data points, to brands. We're not ever going to be ad supported. But there's many ways to make money to fund that. But we are privately funded and we're very happy with where we are today. In fact, I have three or four of my investors sitting in the audience today. Yes, they're all the ones that are older than everybody else. <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, young man. Down at the front, David. Also, we have one coming in online as well, so that cool. will be after your question. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. You're uh, welcome. I'd just like to, it's not really a scientific question, but 
what have you learned from your career about kind of taking initiative? And um, it sounds like a lot of the things you did, you kind of jumped into them with, but you mentioned passion. And do you think that that's like the key to your success? Thank you for saying I'm successful. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. Um, and I love that question because that's really why I'm here. That's why your organisers asked me to come and talk. So if you could look at yourself in 20 years' time, there's one thing I know that I learned that worked for me. is very, very small, consistent, persistent changes. I used to be a little bit heavier than I am today. It took me a number of years to lose quite a lot of weight and I've never put it back on because I did very small things every single day and I stayed the course. Going back to my career, I knew nothing about media. I don't have a uh, degree from university. You don't really need one back then doing media, right? It wasn't something you could even learn in, in, in um, university. But being a little bit out of your comfort zone and having a little bit of research is what really helped me. So when I'd walk into a room, I'd looked at pictures of the speakers, I'd kind of understood, and so I could easily say, hi, David, how's that bank account, blah, 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 going? How's that app going? How's the dog going? And I, people, you wanted to be relatable, right? Well, what is the difference between me and you? <laughs> maybe 20-something maybe years, but that's it, really. I have all the same dreams and aspirations that you guys have right now, I had except I grew up on a council estate with no money, with no access to education, and with no real, like, where were we with, what, what was my path? It wasn't kind of laid out for me. Does that answer your question? Little small things every day. Fantastic. Okay, so we have one coming in from online. So given the ISS is going to be decommissioned soon, <coughs> how are you planning to send people um, up there in the next 30 years? Great question. <laughs> and uh, months before that happened, we've actually decided to do a free flyer, which is around the earth. Who watched Countdown on Netflix? Anybody? Good God. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Right, if you haven't watched it, that's your homework. If you will miss it, if you choose to accept, is watch Countdown. The reason why, it's a four-part documentary about Inspiration4. It is a similar version of what we eventually want to do, except it was one billionaire buying three tickets for him and his, and his people. So it was a $200 million mission, and he had the money. He had the money to do that. We want to do something similar, but obviously we're raising the money and we're privately funded. And we're, not, we're, not, we're giving the ticket away. So they went around the Earth four times on a Dragon free flyer from SpaceX. So that is one of the options we have. We also have an option to go to the moon. We also have an option to go above the ISS. Eventually, we could go to parts of the ISS. If you know about all the new habitats that are being built, there's a lot of news and press you can look up. And eventually, we're already in dialogue with SpaceX today to go to Mars on the Starliner. Fantastic. So, does anyone have maybe one more question? Otherwise, we'll end it here. No more? Okay, well, fantastic. So, can we say thank you again thank to Deborah, please? Thank you. Thank you so much.